presentations, uh, which is our chapter four kinesis presentation, uh, part of the Master of Science in Computational and Advanced Design program, which is accredited by the UACG in Sofia. The program pushes the boundaries of design and translates through a multitude of design skills while advancing immensely the students' design and software capabilities. And it's organized in five leading design chapters and five supporting technical labs so that span over nine months. Uh, today, as I mentioned, we're reviewing chapter four, Kinesis. So the students have already presented and have been through the previous chapters of their work. Um, as I introduced today's review, we'll have uh, basically a zoom around the mirror boards, um, which are a work in progress, uh, just to display some of the work that the students have done in the past uh, month or so. And uh, as usual, I would like to start with uh, a gratitude towards our students and their hard work, um, again towards uh, chapter four, Kinesis. Um, amazing efforts, beautiful uh, visionary work. Like I'm excited to see how everything is also like come together in this chapter. Uh, we've had with us our core leads uh, who are always by the student side, uh, Eva Hapes and Tung Hengen, and my peers uh, Tsvetelin and Georgiev and Michael Pryor. Uh, but also our amazing chapter leads who are generously sharing their unique design and software workflows. Um, and uh, in this chapter we had Zenet Topao, uh, who is founder on uh, Zen's design, as well as Pedro Venegas Rodriguez, who is CEO and researcher at Lima Labs and so many other roles that he plays, as well as our technical lead in the program. So thank you everyone really for um, making this happen. Beautiful work, excited to see everything coming together. Uh, amongst our guests today, we have uh, some of our returning guests uh, as we move forward to the presentations. They're going to, some of them are going to join. Uh, we're thankful for everyone's support and time today. Um, and uh, today, like I would like to introduce like some of our uh, new guests uh, just for basically like chapter four that are joining us. Uh, Jacques Perrault, uh, who uh, just joined us, who is a senior full stack engineer. Uh, Pelon Gura, uh, who is a lead designer at Rolls Royce, and Tom Pali, the designer of B Meta. Uh, welcome, guys. Uh, we're excited to have you today. Um, and I'm just going to go through a little bit of more information about about like um, the chapter four and what chapter four really is about. Uh, it's an uh, its objective is really interknitting uh, the theoretical and design systems built in the previous models and of uh, the body, the dwelling units, the clusters in the forms of neighborhoods. Uh, and this entanglement of various complex systems is weaved together by the transportation and mobility systems. So we're reviewing horizontal spatial systems, pneumatic, underground, organic growth based systems, etc. The students develop comprehensive mobility networks and vehicles through various non-destructive and reversible design workflows in Maya, Zebra, Grasshopper, and mainly this chapter has been really the introduction of Houdini. Um, so it has been really exciting to really like advance uh, the workflows and add this layer of complexity to the project. Uh, some important uh, really points uh, that everyone needs to keep in mind for this review is uh, the reminder that this is not an architectural masters. We're really envisioning uh, the future of humanity, a very science uh, fiction approach into the designs. We're really pushing computational and advanced design, but uh, on the um, design level. So that's what, uh, you know, like a lot of the, you know, designs that you're going to be able to see today are about. Uh, we are reviewing vehicle and transportation systems level design that has emerged from this, as I mentioned, the students' previous work in the previous chapters. Uh, they've created already living spaces, neighborhoods, um, and also a prosthesis that it's actually a new being, um, depending on their uh, personal um, ideas on how they would like to gear their conversations and the projects that they are creating. And we're also uh, very much looking into personal and public vehicles and stops and parking, uh, as well as the transit network networks and physical uh, or implied transit networks that we're going to see today. 
Uh, please keep in mind the presentation should be contained to within seven minutes and reviews will be no more than seven minutes as well. Uh, Evan Tung will help us uh, keep time and uh, feel free to take photos, screenshots, share the work on social media. Uh, it's open and uh, yeah, I think it's super exciting. Without further ado, I'm just going to hand it over to the first team, uh, Group A from EVA. Hey. Hello guys, let's start with Group A. We have Maria and MSK with us. Hello everyone. Hello. Okay, uh, welcome to Neonopolis. This is MSK and Maria. As a massive asteroid came towards Alaris, the elite members of X mutants and Y mutants built a spaceship in a rush and jumped into hyperspace too close to the planet, thereby creating a massive hole and killing them. The surviving group of X and Y set out into space in a cryogenic vault, returned and found Alaris as a planet with a hole in middle. They discovered that the gravity has become unpredictable and they have to rebuild the planet from the scratch. The first agenda of the Zale Council was the Zale experiment to mutate a symbiotic relationship between both the X and Y mutants. The mutation experiment was conducted to create the XY mutants with increased endurance, higher intelligence and uh, ability for flight. Both the mutants had different needs and requirements in terms of living and working spaces as they can choose to exist uh, separately or uh, together. The establishment of the living spaces for the mutants was the next priority. We started by synthesizing a special biological compound which had similar properties to the petals of flowers and created the Flayada. The Flayada corpuscle features several sleeping capsules which can accommodate both the mutant types and a landing pad to access each corpuscle and an emergency exit to be used in times of disaster. The bubbles were designed, uh, designed as a crucial part of the experiment which has greatly increased the protection for the sails. Once this was created, we created the first settlement in New Alaris, the Neonopolis. Since gravity was an issue, we developed a gravity regulator to bring down the uncertainties in the gravity field. The devices were designed to reduce the uncertainty by using water to create a counter vortex, thereby also purifying the water and making it usable. It has been designed in a way that uh, the central part of the uh, and the center part of the cluster as the public spaces and, and the private spaces are arranged around the central part. Uh, then we started to work on transportation inside and outside of the city development. Since each style is different, we looked into procedural developments of the transport models. The private and public transport are developed together to link them both uh, since they uh, the docking stations and outside network. The private transport can be procedurally uh, changed as per the wishes of the user. The public transport was decided to be a train that runs on a light uh, rails in order to transport more users effectively. The networks uh, were developed with our uh, to use the existing gravity fields. The docking station links to external public transport uh, to the private vehicles. We present you our uh, first prototype of private vehicle. The vehicle is connected to the data stations inside Neopolis to gather the gravity waves data and navigate accordingly. The private vehicle is a single user glider which can accommodate all types of mutants. The Y mutant can use the private vehicle to gather data on the surface of Alaris. Together with the X mutant, the vehicle gains additional functionality since the mutant can now detect the electromagnetic waves directly, hence allowing them to travel further. The energy model is designed in a way such as the glider can harvest the energy directly from the gravity waves, uh, which gliding and use uh, that energy to accelerate the vehicle. The various parts of the vehicle are made by additively manufacturing, hence allowing to easily repairably and customization. The public transport 
was designed to be effective as possible to transport the exiles between clusters. The solution was to use light rails ch uh, changed in each cluster. The train has energy reserves, uh, which also use the magnetic waves to generate energy while traveling to have extended reach. The front of the train has a glass orb, which houses the main navigation space. The train can be controlled independently by its exiles, but also can connect it to the data stations inside the clusters. Inside the passenger section, the exiles have a variety of seating options which they can choose from. For X mutants, we have also created hanging bars uh, for easier seating. The interior structure is made of a soft material, which can be easily transformed as a per exile seating posture. Here are a few more shots of the interior of the train. Okay, uh, we then worked on the public and private network networks for the transportation. The public lines were designed isolated to the cluster to run, uh, run outside the cluster for minimal disturbance. Various stations connect the public transport to the cluster in, in uh, different places. Inside the cluster, we have developed the nodes to connect the corpuscles by running a, a shortest path algorithm. The interior of the cluster has the private corridor which connects the corpuscles to the private space, the public and private spaces. Three levels, L1, which connects uh, each other uh, corpuscles, the L2, which connects the corpuscles to the uh, public spaces, and L3, which allows to navigate inside the pub uh, public spaces. The docking station is directly connected to the train station in order to allow the navigation for the ZLs. The train station features two platforms in each one, which allows for uh, the boarding in and uh, getting out of the passengers. The docking station uh, features a uh, parking for the private vehicles, which can be stored and then uh, re uh, reused once the, uh, they re return from the public transport. So this is a, a complete view of the all the networks together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. I love to see how the project progressed and how everything is coming together. It makes a lot of uh, really like sense how everything is uh, combined. I love that the just the language that you're using throughout the, the whole story. It's also cohesive. I love that uh, you really like gave us a glimpse about like each aspect of the vehicles and how they're really, uh, you know, like moving along. I feel that um, Definitely, it's very interesting, you know, uh, ideas that you're having, especially when we're talking about gravity um, and how like the vehicle is combined with the prosthesis. The prosthesis itself also is a vehicle of its own, right? Like so um, it would be interesting also like to see like how exactly like this, like wings attach or how the prosthesis also moves in space, like as a, you know, like an addition to um, all these, uh, you know, like different aspects of mobility that you have, that it's very special to to your project only, right? Because uh, this project uh, has something special that it is like this attachment to to this uh, flight mode. Um, and I feel that uh, exactly like there is like this image that you had like of the prosthesis sitting on the vehicle. It somehow like becomes something bigger, right? Like it incorporates uh, again, like yes, the, the body, like it uh, it fits in um, and it gives a lot of uh, space. So for me, that one of the questions would be how what is the difference between like moving with the vehicle or without obviously because the prosthesis has the ability to move with the wings okay uh, so the vehicles like uh, used by the y mutant separately they can like uh, transport them to uh, outside the cluster to gather data in a shorter distance and along with the x mutant it can allow them to travel further because it will be difficult for the character to like the user to uh, directly uh, travel a longer distance so this will uh, uh, like the transport will help them by uh, like harvesting the energy from the magnetic waves and then using it to increase the uh, reach of the uh, the mutants. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, so the, then in this case, yeah, uh, in this case, yes, I would definitely, um, you know, like um, encourage you to look into, you know, creating a diagram, maybe like showing, you know, like exactly like these different reach and when, you know, like uh, the body and then like the prosthesis itself is uh, self-sufficient to move freely, like uh, up to certain distance, then when is the um, private vehicle being used and what is the distance again, or like, uh, you know, like uh, where the public vehicles like play a bigger role. I think that that's also like, you know, like a storytelling mechanism or like diagram to show like this aspect. But, you know, like other than that, that this is something like to to think about, like as a just be better explanation of the overall idea. I feel that like you guys are really killing it and I love like everything that you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I make a comment? Sure. So uh, MSK and Maria, thank you so much. I think uh, I actually personally would like to um, thank Maria for really considering the um, like the material parts. I, I think it's it's this like the best choice because I remember she was trying like some graphic um, you know design and some of the panels, but she already she had so many panels. So I think this amount is really good. So it came out really nice. Last time we weren't able to see the docking stations, but I think you've nailed it as well. I love that shot that you were you showed the relationship uh with the train and so on and i think you made some um i think the train looks different last time i remember yeah so it's also good i love that the interior the, the structure so i think overall uh it is a really great project and the fact that you've used you've chosen to go with houdini the whole time it's really valuable for this chapter so you really showed us the power of houdini so thank you so much um yeah, it was really fun working with you all. Thank I'll you. say the same. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have too much co to comment to this project, but I, I want to congratulate you guys because this is a really beautiful and really consistent project since since the first chapter till this point. And I, I personally think that the interior is a whole successful. And I, I, you know that you know that we were torturing you ab about the interior, and I think this is a good solution as well. But probably I would like to see I would like to see different types of material in the interior as well as the, as, as you are doing in the exterior. You have a lot of lightning codes in the exterior that I think you should use even in the interior uh, to start seeing like the different areas you have in the interior for those who are sitting, for those who are hanging. You know, Th that's the only comment that I have. But apart from, apart from that, I think this is a really, really, really good project. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Yeah, coming in uh, from the outside, it's a little bit difficult. I, I lack the context of how this project's been built up over time, but um, at first glance, it's, it's super cool. Like it's a uh, very aesthetic way of feeling. And so yeah, congratulations. Like it's really, really interesting. Uh, one one thought I, I did have had to do with um, having a, a slightly stronger schematic of the actual transportation system and how it's working. Uh, I think that you have like some really compelling points there having to do with flow lines given magnetism, but you were also mixing in uh, how like some shortest path algorithms. So I think it would just be having a, a slightly stronger schematic would be would be meaningful. Um, yeah, and then from a technical point of view, there were there were some renderings that had a bit. Uh, they ended up being a bit flat. Uh, only in that, um, especially the ones that were in daylight of the overall structure, um, just make sure that those don't get blown out, you know. Um, so so this one in particular, you know, I, when you compare this to the one that's shot at night, the one at night has so much more depth. Um, so so just be 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 careful of, uh, you know, how much how much light is in the scene. So um, but overall, really, really cool project and um, yeah, really cool to see. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Congratulations, guys, also from me. It's an amazing project. It's it all like this chapter also adds very well to the previous chapters. Um, I really liked, uh, as Pavlina mentioned, the private vehicle. It's um, really interesting and like the, um, the render with the prosthesis. It's amazing. 
and also um, the transportation systems uh, you have uh, very uh, nice um, visuals and i agree with the previous comment that some of them are like not uh, really the best uh, so you could work a bit on on the daylight plot but uh, thank you so much amazing project thank you thank you very much Yeah, please. Yeah, please. one second. Yeah, before we move forward. Yeah, I think that exactly like we got like some really good um, feedback, and I think especially like the the logics behind the projects, right? Like and how they were um, um, created. That's a very interesting and important aspect because again, like when you're working with non-destructive uh, workflows, right? It's not as evident to them to the eye, right? Like what exactly like the process has been. So definitely any kind of process diagrams explaining the logics behind either the vehicles or the systems that are connecting like uh, the cityscapes, like I think that they're very valuable for especially like, you know, uh, people who are not in your project to understand and to to remember them. So that's a really good like point, um, a general point for everyone. Sure, we'll, we'll work on it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you guys. And I really want to comment the same as an upset for being committed to Hoodney, what this chapter was about. And you had such a versatile result because of the procedural pipeline that you choose. And overall, you have so nice details and an amazing project in the end. Thank you. Thank you. Eva. Thank you guys. So let's move on. OK, thank you. Let's move on to A3. Laura. Hi. <clears throat> um, I'm preparing. The screen. OK, it should be should be OK. OK, you see correctly. Let me see yep. this one here. OK, um, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Laura and today I will present you Agalma. The story began in 2240 when the human being starts to discover a new planet which is called uh, Varia. In Varia planet, they discover a new organism which have the capacity to, to uh, change and adapt according to the condition of the planet. But apparently the human body wasn't able to land and work with this organism since the human body wouldn't allow them. For this reason, they demutate and change the body to a cyborg. The cyber body was uh, presents a stronger skin, but most important, it presents the organism of the Varia planet inside of the body with the internal with an internal core. Once the body has been mutated, they also created a unit where to live and um, and work with the cupularia. And as the body was working, also cupularia uh, was presenting an internal core um, from where they was spread the uh, the power uh, the power the energy um, of the of the organism. And inside this unit, they had the main uh, the main function as to the media lab to um, to power up the body of the cyborg, but mostly the growing lab where to store the organism and research and research and study them. Once the unit was built, it starts to grow by the time and create an aggregation, what is called a necessity aggregation. And inside the aggregation, we had the uh, different spot where the cyborg was living, have a social life as the plaza, but also main spot where to work and, uh, and research the, uh, the organisms. Um, but between the units, uh, the most important part was uh, also the connection between them since there was a network. And this, for this reason, they built two type of network, one private and one uh, public network. The public network have the more capacity, the, the more function to connect the main spot, the public spot, the, the plaza and the working area that we saw before. But the, and the from the other side, the product next was uh, attempt to connect the smallest area as the living unit and the storage unit. And the connection between the, the private and the, um, and the public network was creating a specific part uh, to develop the, uh, the station. The station is an architecture divided into two levels. In the first level, 
in the, in the first level we had the uh, it, it store it is mainly for the public uh, network and the low level so the private uh, for the private sector. And in the private uh, level, the low level, we have the dock station. The dock station are meant to be a charge column where the vehicle can be uh, placed there and um, take the energy from it. And it present applied part and the energy power. Um, the private, the private the private uh, vehicle are, uh, are meant to be just for one user. They are characterized by uh, a front glass and a sensor skin all along all along the surface, as well as two uh, two main doors, uh, two small doors that uh, I aim to let the user um, uh, sit into, and the, mecha the mechanical connection on the left, on the right, and from the other side, like the back part of the private vehicle, we have the engine. Uh, characterized by the tube on the top back part of the vehicle and the line system all along the surface, as well as the host um, for the mechanical connection, and we can see also the connection with the with the duck station. Um, once the vehicle is not used, it's stored on the duck station inside the uh, inside the lower level of the main um, station. And we have also the public. Um, the public vehicle. The public vehicle are uh, are bigger, are differentiated because presents the cargo space, a conduction space, but also the sitting space for more people. Um, it characterized as the private vehicle from a um, from a protection skin, and the engine and the engine has the private vehicle is situated on the back part, uh, characterized by um, by uh, the the connection of the tubes. Internal part of the public vehicle uh, is a wide space that is not just used for sitting and transport people, but also the cyber can be recharged in body uh, uh, through the energy uh, middle energy column. And through a section, we can see better the sitting um, of um, the sitting space on the side of the vehicle, the um, the access ramp in in the middle of the vehicle, and the energy column in. Um, in the middle. Um, oh, oh. Sorry. <laughs> and with this uh, last view, I would like to thank you to, um, to listen to me and I hope you enjoy the Adama project. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> I'm so so glad to see everything coming together on this project. <laughs> uh, I feel that everything is like really working so well. It's so well integrated, like through like all these layers and uh, the materiality and the just the language of you know like again the vehicles. I love like how you're thinking about different levels. Um, you know like how to utilize also like again like the charging stations as you know like these prostheses have been you know really uh, moving through space um, I'm interested to see more about like the private vehicle and how does it connect with the prosthesis because we see like the uh, the public one and how it incorporates it but I think oh okay so that's a very very important yes image perfect because like again like how exactly like the the body is laying into the space like of the vehicle i love the materiality and everything that like you've created i also appreciate a lot all the diagrams uh that like you've incorporated into the storytelling because they're making your story so much more powerful and so much easier to understand uh really the logic behind it uh, on a different scale and different level that like you're working with so really uh <laughs> really amazing work uh, you are a superpower and uh, yeah thank you so much for beautiful work, Laura. <laughs> Thank you, Alina. I want to thank you, Laura, for the for the effort you did here. There are, there are a ton of things that are new for me, uh, just starting with interior. I, on, <clears throat> I only have one comment for the interior. I think that you are you have a lot of space that you are not using properly. That's my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. I think that you should use more seats in the interior. But mm -hmm. apart from that, that's just a personal comment, obviously. I think the design, it's really well done. Uh, I also I also think that the materials that you chose are really nice. Even the pattern, I think, looks really nice. But, uh, but apart from that comment, I think this is a really good project, honestly. 
you did such a such a good work. Congratulations, Lara. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you also for your support and your help along the process. <laughs> no worries. It's fine. Hey, Lara. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I actually agree with all the comments. I think uh, all the materials, like the final images are like really good. Um, the fact that not one single material overcome the other, uh, that you find a balance like uh, between all those things, I think it's really good. Um, and I, I really like, I, I, I totally agree with Pavlina um, about the diagrams. I think they were really good. And this is what we expected from this chapter as well, to really makes us you know to really um understand like how things are working and so i think in that terms those are like really good materials um yeah thank you so much <laughs> thank you so much for thank your efforts you as you. well <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for your class thank you laura uh, very very good job uh, i very much appreciate the way that uh like you play with mechanical but also some organic parts so you, like your design is somewhere in like between those two so it's it's very unique it's super nice uh i would say the it's just the hexagonal patterns maybe like that you repeated on over the surface i think you can have a little bit more control over them in mm -hmm. the sense that like the way that they're distributed among the surfaces uh mm -hmm. but or because they're like pretty much the same in terms of the scale for the public and the private vehicle but apart from that, uh, a very, a very nice project and very, very good job doing it on your own. Thank you. I mean, with the help of the tutors, of course. <laughs> yeah. She really it. tried <laughs> her best in Houdini. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, she has a unique style, but. <laughs> yeah. I need a couple hours more with Houdini. <laughs> <laughs> You're always welcome. You can always ask us, you know, reach out to us. <laughs> well. Don't it's worry. a lifetime challenge. I will abuse it. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Thank you. Um, yeah, the uh, overall the project is really, really cool. I think it's uh, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, the only slight notes I had, and I think it's more about it's probably in that you were presenting it in kind of a slide based format. So we're moving from image to image. Um, whenever you have something like this, just make sure, especially if you're changing um, an object's orientation, it can sometimes, uh, especially to a new viewer, become a bit confusing. So you may need to rely upon things like contextualization, even patterning, you know, so that they can better orientate themselves to what is a, a, a changing view of, of, yeah. a, of a singular object. Very slight comment, but no, um, really the, the only other thought I had, those, those hero shots where you're contextualizing it within a landscape, those are challenging that and it looks really good. Uh, so it's very impressive. Like those are tough renderings to pull off. Um, so the Isn't only it? comment I, yeah, exactly. Like this looks really good and it's a challenging rendering to do really well. The only idea that I did uh, that I was thinking is you might be able to rely upon a bit of texturing in order to get the background uh, to pop or distinguish itself from the underlying um, from from your really designed elements. So that might be one one idea to to kick this up just another couple percent. But um, these are these are super challenging renderings to do and, and 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 not look cheesy. You know, that's the real problem when you contextualize something with an organic material like that. So I think right now it looks fantastic, but that might be able to, to turn it up just a couple degrees. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Laura. Also from me, it's a really strong project. I really enjoyed uh, the whole storytelling from the uh, the the initial, like the the beginning. It was very strong until the end. Uh, I agree that materials, the overall design, everything is really really strong. Um, I also agree that the diagrams are very important, and you did a very good job with them. I only wish to uh, to see them in uh, a bit more in a detail so just zoom more maybe next time just to see more from them but overall it was amazing thank you thank you <clears throat>
Okay, congratulations, Laura. I'm super happy we made up to this hair and we <laughs> finally see everything happening. And uh, I really appreciate your consistency from chapter one to the till now, the language of your design, the minimalism in your design and the details that you take care. So I'm really happy that we have this project so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Eva, to push me and support me. Yeah, always. <laughs> Okay, if you have the performance, let's move on. Okay, next we have Ryan and Kong, A4. Hello, we are A4, Kong and Ryan. Welcome you, hey all, to, yeah, welcome you all to our world <laughs> of strategic tree symbiosis. Hey, in case you're wondering, I'm Ryan and he's Kong. <laughs> but yeah, let's begin. So. In this post-apocalyptic world with insufficient resources and human extinction crisis, the Cyborg Republic invites humans to transcend into cyborgs. However, to embrace the total rationality of cyborgs, humans need to eliminate their emotions. In order to persuade humans into becoming emotionless, the Republic spreads propaganda in the human society, brainwashing, them, brainwashing those from the lower class into believing that they can experience eternal happiness by becoming a cyborg. In reality, their brains and bodies are stimulated constantly by the prosthesis. The chemicals produced by the brains will be collected for agricultural use. Their emotional capabilities are abused to the point that they can no longer produce any more chemical substances in their brains. They are now cyborgs working as labor forces to restore nature until their organic body decay. The Republic produces and exports resources back to the human society just enough to keep them alive, but not enough for them to overpopulate. As long as there are humans who live miserable lives of poverty and hunger, there will be new volunteers to join the Cyber Republic and keep the system running. This is an ironic narrative suggesting that a sustainable and peaceful ecosystem could only be done by eliminating the presence of humans from humans themselves. Earth nowadays is far from the paradise it used to be. Humans annihilated not only their own creations, but also the concrete foundation of the ecosystem, causing fatal damage to the environment. Nature can no longer repair itself as usual. In order to bring eternal balance to a system, it requires a synergy between the living and the non-living in a comparable amount. From the smallest scale of a cybernetic organisms up to the scale of the amalgamation, all considered as cogs, interacting constantly with one another a vast amount of exchanges in data and resources is necessary to maintain the stability of the system. Reciprocus is a logistic infrastructure that connects numerous fundamental units within the Republic. Simplifying the network into the most optimized paths, yet efficient enough for the highest mobility and rapid resource interchange. Starting at the microscopic level of the Republic, the cyborgs, Newcomers will be equipped with their first set of processes and will start a new life as liberal. Liberal can use their happiness to purchase more processes to achieve even more pressure in this delusional fantasy. Up until the point they are fully equipped and eventually transformed into the next stage known by the name of Benchita. In this stage, they will be able to reach their eternal happiness for several weeks before they run out of emotion and fully transform into a pure cyborg titled by the name Asheso. A Shesso is a handsome form of humans where they surpass human physicality and intelligence, but more importantly, they are able to eliminate the ultimate strength of human beings, their emotions. These cyborgs coexist in different areas, each contributing differently to a system. During the stage of liberal, they will be restricted within euphoria, the corpuscles of the system which acts as a living cell that collects infinite amounts of emotions from the inhabitants processes them in the form of resources and feeds them back to both the amalgamation and the human society. It consists of several important spaces, such as the pleasure dome, an enclosed, enclosed psychedelic built environment, specifically designed to maintain the aesthetic condition of the users, as well as the charging station and the psychotropic farm, all to collect, transfer and store the emotions from the liberals. After several months inside Euphoria, the barrel will then rotate to the second stage, Felicita. 
They are now able to access facilities outside of Euphoria. These outdoor spaces provide higher and wider range of pressure in order to drain their last bits of emotions. These spaces spread across the towers. Felicita can reach their desired destination using the Orphanims, a compact vehicle that also acts as the chargers. It's basically designed to work cohesively with the processes by connecting the ports on their spine. Felicita now gains the mobility to travel within the single tower through an internal private network. After several months in this fantasy realm, the cyborgs will finally transcend into a perfect version of beings, the emotionless entities, a shesso. During this ultimate stage, they will be working as labor force, operating and maintaining the system. Up until the point that their organic body reaches death, their mechanical prosthesis will then be recycled and redistributed to new volunteers. The main working ground for Asesso is located at the synthetic landscape level, where most of the agricultural actions happen. Asesso can travel freely across this vast landscape using a high-speed portable vehicle called the Myrmidus. This vehicle has an ability to transform between two operation modes, bike mode and crawler mode. Each mode is designed for a different type of terrain. The motion of the Myrmidus is controlled directly through the neural linkage of, from the cyborg. Major facilities within this level are connected together through an external private network with the primary linear paths and secondary branches at specific points. The docking stations for Myrmidus are located beneath these access points of the network. A CSO can interchange between the external and internal private networks allowing them to access internal facilities down below through the elevating platform. The last type of vehicle, Euphoros, allows a direct connection between every tower. It consists of three compartments. The first compartment includes the control center, operated by a chaisel, and the incubating chambers, a portable psychedelic space which serves as a passenger cabin. The second compartment contains several bike charging stations, while the last compartment serves as a resources container. Euphoros operate on the public network, a single loop circulation system running across the entire amalgamation. It consists of multiple micro stations around the wells, and the public docking station located at the edge of the Republic extends toward the human societies. Reciprocus is the solution to ultimate efficiency. We, the Republic, envisions an ideal system of fair exchange between the organic and the inorganic. It is designed to not only support the migrations within the Republic, but also bridges the two contradicting foundations of the system. The organic system, humans, cannot survive independently without our constant feeding of resources, while, we, the mechanical system of the new world, is functionless without new human volunteers, the primary biological resources essential for us to be perpetual. These two complex systems of contradicting fundamentals complementing each other, greatly echo with the ideology of contradictory symbiosis which, we, the Republic, strongly, believes in. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you guys. It's always so incredible to see like every presentation that, that you guys are putting together and how you're really like advancing through the program. I think that you have a rare gift of really understanding storytelling, uh, really going into it like fearlessly uh, complementing each part of really the storytelling with uh, this visual content like it's so seamlessly really um, organized and put together. Obviously the work it's in a very very high quality but I just feel that the integration between like the, the story and the images uh, that like you're providing to you know like uh, show all this is just amazing. And it has been from the beginning, right? Like from uh, using really mid journey to just get inspired to really this uh, really complex systems that are created uh, with non destructive workflows with Houdini. 
uh, with uh, uh, you know grasshopper and so on and so forth. Uh, what I love about it is also that the tr the strong for transformation stages that you have on the prosthesis and now how the vehicles also play a role in these transformations. So again, like following these like ideas from the beginning to the end. Um, and again, like super strong visuals and very strong design language that complements uh, the story and all aspect of it. So really beautifully put uh, presentation and work. I uh, really commend you again uh, on, you know, like an amazing presentation and everything that like comes with it. So thank you guys for really keep pushing like so, and creating this amazing content. Thank you very much, Pepe. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Ryan and Conk, so <laughs> I really want to uh, congratulate you because I think this presentation was really smooth and was really well put together, to be honest. Um, everything was like so clear, so on point. Um, and I really, really appreciate your patience and effort during the uh, during that those two weeks because we always get back and change so many things, but uh, <laughs> you, you were you were like, so hardworking since the beginning, so thank you so much. But I can really see, uh, I'm really happy that you, you know, play with the colors and make some connection with your previous chapter. So everything is looks really good. Um, I have no comments, but really great work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sandra. <laughs> From my side, I, this, I want to congratulate part. you guys as well. Um, I don't have too much to comment, honestly, because I think you did a really good job since the beginning of this chapter. Maybe the only comment, if I should give you a comment, I can do. But regarding the private vehicle, the only thing that the only thing that I was expecting is to see thicker cables in the spine of the rider. That's the only comment mm. that I have. But apart from that, everything is perfect. I think I think now you be now you are you are uh, Arnold Render monsters right now. <laughs> such so a good, thanks for such your a good teachings. Job. It, it was a pleasure to work with you guys, honestly. Thank you so it much. It's a pleasure too. Thank, Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations, guys! It's a really unique project, and uh, it's really hard not to fall in love with it. It's amazing, like the whole presentation, the storytelling. Also, the previous chapters, every time when I see uh, like your presentation, it's like unique, amazing. So um, I don't have any any much more to comment than just to congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have much either. It's really cool. Um, yeah, did a great job. Um, Again, uh, the only the only maybe micro comment would be, I think, as a board, especially that diagram of how these um, how these humans are evolving, works probably excellent. But when you're presenting, just remember that you know a title here or a title there can help uh, contextualize um, viewers mm -hmm. over time. So, so micro comment, but but awesome. And then the last is um, this is a challenging one to render. I mean, you have so many colors. This is tough you know like uh but it also gives you the most opportunity and i think that uh over time you'll want to just slightly like there's some images that really have like beautiful character like this one that's being presented oh my goodness it's, it's super super captivating you want to make sure that you can carry uh, a certain amount of tonality across all of your imagery to build a really really cohesive uh, presentation because the, some of the images are so, so compelling and, and you just want to make sure that that, that carries all the way through. But um, in general, awesome work. So. Thank you so much. Who keep that in mind? I have just a slight comment, like all the good comments are great. And just I'm wondering about the public network. Uh, it's. I would say you still need to uh, I don't see the connection between like the private and the public vehicle uh, the private and public network uh this would be my only comment maybe a question you can like further like elaborate on it ah okay yeah. uh so uh yeah go ahead okay <laughs> sorry let me go ahead uh so first uh the public the public 
it's in the public network. It's basically yes. a loop in between uh, within the towers itself, and then it also reaches out towards uh, the human societies, which we're not showing right now. But uh, then uh, there is this internal private network, which uh, it's uh, there we use uh, the the often to trans transfer uh, the cyborgs down towards uh, the synthetic landscape level and also uh, to the towers itself. And then within the towers, uh, they are all interconnected uh, with each other uh, uh, from our amalgamation. And these are all the uh, the, the charters, the, the, the orphan names that we're talking about. And then uh, at the synthetic landscape level, these are like the working grounds of SSO, the emotionless cyborgs, and they are the users of uh, Mermidus, the, the transforming bike. And the network would be uh, the, the cyan color one, but those near the ground level. And they are also connected uh, to the ground, uh, the internal private networks. So everything is linked together, but they're for different types of cyborgs. Okay, thank you. I hope this is clear now. I, I'm, I'm yeah, sorry, but yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, team. I think everything good about the project has been said so far, but I also want to appreciate on one uh, additional point that is uh, with your team that you always look forward for the next chapter. Show us the glimpse that uh, you're going to cover in the next chapter and end it in, on a very um, cinematic note uh, with your presentation, which is very nice and like makes the presentation more like a like a movie trailer or something, which is very impressive. Thanks. Thanks, Ewa. Yeah. Okay, if there is uh, no more to add, let's move on. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, guys. Thank you. So next we have Shivani and Akash from A5. Hello, everyone. Hello. Okay. Hi. Uh, let me share my screen. Welcome screen. to yeah, it's visible. Okay. Welcome to our chapter four Kinesis after Earth O one. I am Shabani. And I'm Akash Kacha. Together, let us walk you through our story. The ancient Hindu prophecy had foretold the end of current yuga, Kali Yuga, and the beginning of new cycle starting from Satyuk. As the end of world approached, scientists had predicted the demise of humanity, and an alien species had offered to allow humans to join their society if they transferred all their data and knowledge to the aliens. The humans agreed, and the aliens created genetic genetically modified embryos for the human souls to inhabit, resulting in the ultimate hybrid being human 2.0, a combination of bird, fishes and humans. Hybrid built new habitat consisting of interconnected petal pods inspired by the lotus flower. The pods contained private spaces like resting dorms and workspaces like laboratories and workshops. The pods were linked to two nodes that contained a meditation chamber and allowed the processes to easily transit within the corpuscle. To create and maintain the new world, the hybrid beings broke down the main corpuscle into modular parts and categorized them based on occupancy from private to public for amalgamation. They focused on con co connecting the three different types of land they had encountered, cliffs, islands, and plateau. A wave-like pattern was created with modular units connecting and flowing into each other. This resulted in S-shaped organic cluster that was visually striking and highly functional when viewed from above. The hybrids recognized the importance of mobility 
and sustainable mobility and efficient transportation systems in the new world. To meet this new need, they designed and built well-designed automobiles that were highly efficient and sustainable using advanced technology and materials. The transportation system of Human 2.0 was designed to be highly efficient with various modes of transport, including self-driving flyers, motherships, and docks. Hybrid designed a unique mode of transport called Mercurial. The Mercurial was a medium-sized flyer. The streamlined body and wings allowed it to move smoothly through the air. Mercurial's foldable wings were a clever design feature that allowed it to occupy less space while parked. The self-lit hull frame of the Mercurial was an innovative feature that provided both protection and style. The hull frame protected the vehicle from damage and also lit up at night, making it easier for the passengers to see and navigate in the dark. The material used to construct the Mercurial was similar to that used in Corpusel, allowing it to blend seamlessly in the environment. Mercurial worked on solar energy. Hybrids had developed advanced technology that allowed them to control the flight of the vehicle using their minds, eliminating the need of traditional controls and interfaces. The curves of the design of the Mercurial added style and elegance to the overall design of the vehicle. The sleek and streamlined body of Mercurial was designed to not only look good, but also to reduce drag and improve the vehicle's aerodynamics. The Atlas is a mothership. One of the defining features is the two aerodynamic wings that extended from either side of the ship, which provide additional stability and maneuverability in space, making it more efficient and safe. The built-in radar technology helped Atlas to avoid obstacles and navigate with these. Another feature of the Atlas is to the ability to carry up to 10 private vehicles, which can dock on top of the ship. The vehicles are securely stored while on the docking mode. The passengers can detach their vehicles and fly to their desired locations, making the Atlas a versatile way. Two skilled pilots of the Atlas operate the ship from the top deck, which is dedicated to the cockpit. The cockpit is equipped with advanced navigation and communication technology, allowing the pilots to control the system by mind using the holographic tech console, which helps them visualize. The passenger entry to the deck is from the back of the vehicle. The bottom two decks of the Atlas are the passenger areas. The main lounge is where the passengers relax and take a quick nap. It is equipped with comfortable sleeping pod and entertainment systems, allowing passengers to enjoy movies, music, and games by traveling. Now coming to the dock. The dock was a highly efficient and functional transportation hub. It consisted of three layered radial structure inspired by the shape of flower, which added to the overall beauty and harmony. The outermost layer consisted of open petals that formed a private vehicle parking area. The design of the petals allowed for the easy access and exit of vehicles, reducing congestion and optimizing the use of space. The middle layer of the dock was designed in the shape of bud and served as a waiting area for hybrids. This layer was a place where the hybrids could gather and wait for their public vehicle to arrive. The central area was designed to accommodate public vehicles, that is Atlas. The private vehicle network has a spine, which is the backbone of the entire system. This spine is the main artery that connects all of the amalgamation together. From the spine, the private vehicles then gets connected to the purposes landing pads. The private vehicle network can sometimes travel inside the amalgamation itself. This means the vehicle can navigate through complex system of tunnels and corridors, allowing them to reach their destination quickly. In contrast, the public vehicle network wraps around the amalgamation like a roller coaster. Swirling around the spines and the towers, it just stops at junctions of the private and public networks meet. Both the networks connect the, connects to the dock, which is at the end of the spines of the amalgamation. As the public vehicles travel through the amalgamation, they make stops at junctions where passengers can board or disembark from the vehicle or detach the private vehicle and fly. These stops are strategically located throughout the networks, allowing the passengers to reach the destination quickly. 
a new era of possibility and promise had begun for humanity, one that would last for eons to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, team. Beautiful storytelling, the visuals towards the end are very compelling. Uh, my comments are going to be towards incorporating the prosthesis into the images that you're showing the vehicles. I think you you know that, right? Like it's not yeah. a surprise to you. Um, again, like since the pro the program is created in this way, that obviously like you have like important like checkpoints like these presentations. Obviously, though the the presentation, the work like of this chapter and the presentation doesn't end here. So definitely that's an opportunity for you guys to really rig this process, see how it's going to like incorporate like the spaces between like the different vehicles that you have, because I think that it's really, really missing the um, a little bit like of the scale and just the functionality since it's made for this uh, specific, um, you know, like body type or, you know, like process that you're really creating. I love the incorporation of the um, private vehicle into also like the, the vehicle that it is um, public. I think it's quite an interesting way like to go about it, um, go about the, the design incorporated. I do feel that there is uh, work that could be done also like on the visual side, right? Like to improve a little bit like of the materiality. So it's a little bit clearer to understand like the, the geometries themselves. Um, but again, like this is again that you have the opportunity like to do that and to really improve the work a little bit more um, on the visual side. On the side of like obviously like incorporating Houdini, learning, bettering yourselves as a team, I think that you guys are always, um, you know, like um, pushing yourselves like out of a comfort zone again, like coming in, into a computational design master's program without, you know, like any previous knowledge like of these um, softwares, so obviously sleep you know like everything is like very new but i feel that like you never give up and you're always uh, learning and being curious and taking all the feedback uh, that you can like from um, the tutors and everyone involved in the program so really congratulations again on really uh, you know like this progress and uh, how you're really like looking into you know like uh, the next uh, chapters of the work so that's for me guys thank you Hi guys. Um, first, mm. first of all, I want to th thank you because for for the effort you did with Houdini, I know that for you it was not really easy, but I really want to thank you for that for the patience you had with with the software. Um, I totally agree with with Pavlina. Uh, material wise, I think it's quite a bit over the top. Um, so I need I think you need to be careful when when choosing materials because i think when you when you start working with too high reflective materials it's quite hard to read the whole the whole model and regarding the private vehicle at least i i think you should work the main body should be done with more pieces um if you if you if you can go to the to the to the explosive um diagram you have yeah, for example, when you see the main body there, I think the main the main body should be done should should have more parts, not just one part. That's why maybe it's quite a bit hard to read the whole model. Mm -hmm. um, but apart from that, I think you, you improve uh, you improve a lot. So you can you can like try to fix the materials later. I think you can do it. I think you can. But but in but overall, it's a, it's a good work. It's Thank a good you. work. Thank you guys. Thank you. Uh, Akash and Shivani, thank you so much. Uh, I remember that you have, as uh, Pedro mentioned, you, I mean, we had some hard time uh, building the logic uh, with the software as well. So seeing every, seeing all these things come together, finally, it's really uh, amazing. So thank you so much, first of all. Um, regarding to the uh, private vehicle, I actually like the pattern that you have uh, just because <laughs> it goes well with the, the main body. I mean, the main overall shape. So I think I'm not really <clears throat> bothered by that. But uh, when it comes to the public vehicle, I totally agree with Paulina and uh, Pedro. Uh, it's too high reflective. <clears throat> and uh, I think I'm not really sure if it's the color choice that you have, but 
feels like so many things going on. I feel like one of them should be uh, eliminated from the from the overall. Uh, maybe like that uh, that branch branches thing. I don't know, but I think uh, if you can just look at this renders again, that would be really cool to develop them further. Maybe like reduce the reflectivity because there is another like with with the reflectivity. There is another like white color up here, so and where they are docking, it's not really clear. For example, um, I, and that was something that was really um, unique for your project. So keep in mind those things. Uh, but overall, I love that um, that big, big, big picture. Uh, that what is that? Uh, yeah, that circulation, you know, uh, diagram. Um, everything everything seems to be working really well with together so thank you so much for these visuals um i'm glad you had fun with houdini <laughs> yes we did thank you for your patience thank you you're welcome it was fun <laughs> yeah i think i think my comments are all pretty much in line it's really cool uh the underlying concept and i think especially like the formwork itself i think is is really moving and uh has a clear direction um but yeah, you know, whenever you have large amounts of illumination globally, as well as individual elements, you know, especially with those renderings, and you, you just need to be careful to make sure that you fully resolve all of your forms. So in part, you know, a lot of tricks you can easily use to do this more, more details would also really help. You know, if you look at your doc, for example, if you just threw a couple more elements on there, it's really going to help it resolve visually for people. So uh, just just small tricks like that, but I, I think it's it's really just turning up the dial a little bit and um, or adding some of these uh, small finishing elements and, and and you'll be in a really good place. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations, guys. For me, uh, most of my comments have already been said, so I uh, agree like with the previous ones. Um, I also think that if you improve a bit the visuals after all the comments that you received, uh, the project will be even better. And uh, thank you for sharing it. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, guys. I agree with the visual comments, uh, but other than that, I really appreciate the progress and the constant efforts that you make towards your project and progress uh, each time with each chapter. So I re really, really appreciate those efforts and I'm so happy to see these coming out so well in terms of design. For sure, we will go back to your renderings. Sure. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Eva. Okay. Thank you guys. Let's move on. Thank to you. Thank you. So let's move on to A6, Kate and Oscar. Hello. Hello. Okay, so um we're Kate and Oscar and we're presenting Engine Project Chapter 4. Let us welcome you all into our symbiotic lagoon. Our story is happening in a not so distant future on the very same earth as you're on right now. In search for an alternative energy source, we made a discovery, a new genus of plants now known to us as symbiophytes that grow directly in connection with the human body. Symbiophytes attach and grow from humans once we pass on. Some have a stronger coupling with symbiophytes than others, enabling incredible structures to be built. We call those people angions vessels through which the symbiophytes get the energy to grow our new environments. Together, the engines and symbiophytes have enabled us to reshape our environments and now provide us with the means necessary for the survival of our society. This ushered in an era of wonderful coexistence between us and the symbiophytes. Maybe it's time for us to present ourselves. We are the bioengineers, or as we often call the rooters, because we work within the underground root systems. Our task is to understand the genetic coupling to the symbiophytes and engines. We also conduct experiments to try and improve and modify the symbiophytes. We already presented our Gen A prosthesis. With this new multi-layer breakthrough, we managed to reach a stable symbiosis and create an all-season adaptable prosthesis. 
we then deployed this corpuscle into, into the um, also released our corpuscle as part of the engineering project. It consists of a living unit and energy core through which the technology of the symbiotic link is enabled. We then deployed this corpuscle into the community, a case study of which is our symbiotic lagoon, where the symbiotes have revitalized the landscape and brought prosperity. Today we will present to you our newest piece of research into root atypical meristems or M cells. We manipulated these undifferentiated cells to create two system of vehicles, a private exploration crawler and a public train, designed to allow for transportation within the community and beyond. We also developed their associate networks and stations throughout our community, allowing for recent mobility within and between the clusters. These networks span the entire community, weaving throughout and between clusters. The Xylem rail network is separated into two, a primary high-speed heavy payload network and a secondary low-speed light payload one, allowing for a variety of uses and connections to numerous nodes. The Floam walking network exists within the clusters, allowing for pedestrian and private vehicle mobility. Stations have been designed to link the private and public networks with smaller station within each cluster and larger one for transport beyond the community. Now let's take a closer look at our private vehicle, the RAM Exploration Claw, a crawler. This vehicle is built and powered using our Simbify technology. It is designed to allow for movement inside the community as well as all-terrain exploration beyond it. The crawler is an all-season, all-terrain vehicle, performing just as well in the harshest of winter environments as it would in summer. The crawler moves in an animalistic fashion, just as a quadruped would. This gives fantastic mobility and great range to explore the surrounding off-network wilderness, as well as uh, navigate through in-community route systems. We'll go back to the gifts later. The vehicle is constructed through a growing through a simplified into a quadruped shape. It is powered through fuel tanks, which store the energy accumulated by photosynthesis. The system works best in, in summer and must be mo more closely managed in winter. The limbs of the symbiophyte use universal joints to enhance their mobility, as well as hydraulics to provide power movement to the framework. The cockpit is made out of hardened glass, allowing for full surround visibility if required, while letting in light for the photosynthesizing bodies of the routers. Leaves and branches allow for energy regeneration while the walker is under sunlight, minimizing energy expenditure. Then it's a long distance high speed ram train, a vehicle also powered by symbiophyte technology. The boarding happens from the cantilevered station platforms simultaneously in all the wagons. The default train build consists of three wagons, making them both maneuverable and spacious enough to transport a large group of the routers. The weather conditions are also no restriction for the adaptable vehicle, which continues to travel even during snowfall. Overall, the train has an aerodynamic shape that contributes to its all season functioning. Here is the animation showing how it moves in various environments. So yeah, maybe we'll watch them later. Um, winter adaptation for the train includes icicle formation in, piece, in place of leaves and glowing glazing for the vehicle to be more visible during long night time in winter. Here are the close-ups. In summer, there are most inclusions in wood material, while in winter, frost covers both wood and glazing. Now let's go through the layers that form the ramp train. Upper root hold the wagon shell and connect it to the railing. Then there is a shell that consists of the symbiophyte plant and glazing. The interior layer explains the occupancy, which is 10 passengers per wagon. During the trip, prosthesis are linked to the inner root system. Lower root layer serve as a railing, which is adaptable in height to the landscape that provides comfortable high speed travel. And the last one is a branch layer that monitors the environment and can provide it feedback for the lower routes to adapt. Following animations show the vehicle travels at high speeds and the train arriving at the station. We'll also watch them later. This is the view from the interior of the crawler. The pilot is connected to the symbiotic uh, sympathetic link to the control panel. The public vehicle interior is spacious enough and for comfortable traveling, and more than half of its shell is area is see through, so the passenger can enjoy the beautiful view. Here you can see the docking stations. The first is the larger one, which can be found at the edge of the community. It connects other communities through the Xylem Rail and the Ram Train. The second is the private docking vehicle routes, 
which each station can host the three vehicle, uh, three vehicles. Here you can see the docking stations in the environment within the community, located in the basement of every living cluster for ease of access. The station is also equipped with a charging system, so the crawlers are recharged to the community's towers. The rail network is also powered through sympathetic energy, at times even glowing to the energy flow. Lastly, here's a view of the main station at the edge of the community. The boarding is in progress. This was an overview of our flourishing society and how it communicates between its parts using technology that we developed to spread prosperity. Thank you for coming to our presentation. Turn tables, please. OK, thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. This one more interesting. When you raise me, sorry about that. I think our gifts are slightly too large and so they keep freezing. Okay, this one's given up, it's interesting. Um, I will get those working in a minute, hopefully. Sorry about that. So we said they're all okay. frozen. Like, yeah, just you know like see if they can play like even now as we are you know commenting yeah. on the work like if you can still like make any of those really yeah, like, we'll work so them. we can see them because I, I you were one of the first ones like starting with the term tables and you know like really making things like yeah exactly that's what you know like what this is about i think it's like absolutely fantastic the work that you guys have put in obviously like <laughs> it was uh, amazing um Surprised to all when you actually started with <laughs> Pedro when even on the first day you were really so advanced. Um, again, a team that like really hasn't worked with Houdini in the past, so that's really commendable. Like how fearless you are, like towards you know like your attitude towards design, and uh, I'm, I'm, we are loving really like seeing like all this obviously, and um, how the vehicles are working and even the impact on the water and you know like really like this unique uh, approach to design um also like working with this duality within the project from the beginning really sticking to it and really showing the winter and summer and the differences between how everything is really working on these different levels um there is just there is just so much beauty in the project that uh, you're working with so much complexity but everything works out like perfectly um you know like so really like it's uh, amazing to see like all this work coming together and how you guys are growing throughout the project and how you're always like managed to surprise us with this like uh, really amazing work. I love the this vehicle especially because again like the linear actuators um, you know like and how like you actually like position them and are working with them so thinking about mobility outside of the box right like and not like when this like pre-described notion of like what is really uh, mobile so Again, really congrats on that. Like beautiful work. Really proud of you guys and of everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Kate and Oscar, hi. Uh, was there someone speaking? Sorry. No? Oh, it's okay. Oh, okay. So, uh, congratulations. Uh, I think this was a beautiful project, even from the beginning. Like the first day, we already had that crawler, you know. But so the rest of the two weeks, I was thinking, like, you know, what, what, to, what should we tell them? Like, you know, because they already, you know, made them ready. So, but uh, we, 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 it was we, like we, we found something. <laughs> uh, anyways, so uh, I love that the projects like um i love that you explained each of those parts separately and um as a whole they they look like what i like about it is that as a whole they look they all have that similar material but eventually you still have the ability to differentiate one from another so i think that's a success and that's shots like where you have that circulation and that rail it, i think it's a really successful um with overall thank you so much Thank you so much for your patience as well, Kate. <laughs> I, I remember that we uh, we killed some time on that, you know, public vehicle. But I think we also had that discussion with the tone of the two woods. Like, I think it looks really cool. I love that uh, seasonal change <laughs> diagram as well. The icing one. Uh, 
uh, overall it looks really good. So congratulations, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. On my side, I don't have too much to say, guys. Um, I totally agree with Zineb. Mm, just congratulations, guys. Also for you, it was a pleasure to work with you as well. Thank you. Good work. Thank you so much. Thank Likewise. You. Congratulations, guys. It's a really strong project, very cohesive uh, with the previous chapters. Uh, very well presented. All the diagrams are explaining everything perfectly. Also, you have very, very strong visuals. It's uh, like so nice to see all of it. I really enjoyed uh, also the close ups. Um, they were amazing. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can just repeat what everyone said. I, I, I absolutely agree. This is a super cool project. Um, I really it's, it's a great example of being able to use a texture in order to really help ground and improve the visual clarity and readability of all of the imagery like that, like all of these read great, um, even though there's like a really large amount of illumination in, in a lot of your images. Um, and I've noticed that across almost all the presentations, there's, there's quite a bit of, of, of global illumination. You can still read these forms fantastically because they have this 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 really pronounced texture. Um, so yeah, really well done. The um, yeah, I, I have nothing really to comment. It's super cool. So thank you, much. Thank, thank you, guys. I want to appreciate not only the the, the beautiful visuals but the diagrams that you explain it. I think you push it even more with the lines and the line work. So. That's a box. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, team, for your consistency and making it so smooth to work with you guys. Like you are really hardworking and push your limits each and every time. And everything is so clear, the clarity in your renders and the choice of your diagrams and everything is super, super, super clear to understand uh, uh, without even explanation. It's uh, so well done. So congratulations on my side as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, now we'll go to group B. Let's start with B1, uh, Nader and Anya. Hello. Hello. Share your screen. Okay, you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Full screen, please. Yep. Hi, guys. My name is Nader, and my group partner's name is Anya, and this is Cerulean. The answer to human survival is not out there, it is here on Earth. As we build equipment to travel off world for supplies, our world slowly deteriorated below. It was too late to search for answers among the other planets, forcing humanity to travel to depths unknown. Hope has been found, however, for a new mysterious, mysterious crystal who holds the answer to the future of humanity. With, with its ability to deliver highly efficient energy and power the whole world's needs, a new civilization is able to rise and recover from the ashes. There's just one catch. The mineral only works underwater. Humanity mutates and changes rapidly, but the crystal's energies accelerate. They adapt for underwater survival. The new civilization, the new civilization decides to take up residence in the Mariana Trench, the deepest part in the ocean. They begin small and grow outwards. As they grow, their need for vehicles expands to ones that can reach locally far and wide. As they expand, they conform and contort to the cave walls around them. As the earth flooded, the trench continued to expand and deepen. These are the five public spaces where these beings can join together. The aquatic oasis, the restoration zone, the town hall, the mineral market and the resource reservoir. It is here where the public vehicle stops to load and unload new passengers. The beings of Cerulean are ever adapting and changing to their underwater environment, 
their dwelling systems spiral and continue along its path following the ocean floor just like a wave. As it branches out, people are in search of continuing their network and of course their everlasting survival. Each new being has their own dwelling and makes up a central system that is interconnected, similarly like the species. It is here where they dock their private vehicles and can return to their homes. Within the public vehicle, there are four levels, premium, economy, private vehicles, and crystal storage. Every being in Cerulean travels by public transportation to get to and from the five public spaces. All of Cerulean is powered by the crystal, including the vehicles. The beings hold it as their highest possession and respect it. They understand it is not just for their survival, but for all of life on Earth's survival depends upon this crystal. The captain maintains trajectory from the deck of the ship where the captain is hooked into the ship using the neural network. Within the private vehicle, the beings of Sulean are seamlessly intertwined with their vehicle. They're able to fit their fins in the slots naturally and provided with the comfortable pads to lay upon that conforms to the latitudinal positioning of their bodies. The emissive windows provide ambient and crucial lighting for the depths of Sulean, as well as key protection from underwater predators with its biomedic design and form. The vehicle's sleek-like ergonomic designs optimize for maximum protection and comfort while the beings traverse the depths of the Mariana Trench. A distinguishing feature of the cerulean blue rippled windows and biomorphic outer surface offers a familiarity to the beings, similar to their own body textures and appearances. The public vehicle lands upon its pad at each of the five public spaces. It is here where the beings can load crystals to be moved around cerulean, as well as transport themselves to the other spaces. The docking mechanism locks the vehicle into space. It is controlled by the captain's neural network. The ramps allow for easy access to the vehicles. The linear nature of the ramps acts as both a landing strip and a takeoff guiding system. The private vehicles dock seamlessly to a tube outside each corpuscle dwelling, providing the beings efficient entry to and from the private vehicle paths. The vehicle tubes are charged with a unique crystal fluid that provides the vehicle restorative powers for daily use. Here, the tubes dock into the back of the propulsion engine of the private vehicle, providing ease of access and departure. Like the public vehicle, most things in Cerulean work on neural network synthesis. These private vehicles dock and undock organically, energetically, and energetically detect the presence of beings to detach from their positions. The civilization adapts using the deep ocean floor and allows the celestial sky a vision to explore and establish the previously unknown. The new generation of humans have created housing structures, public meeting spaces, and vehicles to suit their needs. As they gaze upwards at the ocean sky, they think of their ancestors and what once was on the surface. But most of all, they think about how lucky they are that the Mariana Trench has provided such beneficial sustenance to continue the human race. New species of plants and animals also emerged alongside humanity. They also grew and gained their new energy from the crystals. Humanity harnessed the regenerative power from the new species around them and became inspired by the new underwater life around them. Cerulean can only continue with the being's persistence for life. They must continue to develop themselves and cities as they push their civilization forward. They are an interconnected being who rely on each other to survive. As they move towards their next chapter, they are pushing their own boundaries forward to create a network of cities far and wide across the ocean floor, not just the Mariana Trench. As the civilization grows and continues to persevere, the cities and connections will also change and adapt for the advancements and changes in lifestyle. Thank you for joining us, and we can't wait to explore the depths of Cerulean with you. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. I love how everything again is coming together in this chapter. Uh, the vehicle is uh, the vehicles are now coming together. There are so many like deta little details that like we see like coming together in this phase of the materiality and uh, how like everything is really uh, coming together. I just want to see again the prosthesis like uh, in the vehicles. Do you have any images like that? Because I wasn't able to see any. Yeah. 
So here's some shots. This is like a top view. Oh, perfect. Yes. OK, that's like incorporating like the the mermaid man like inside <laughs> the vehicle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perfect. OK, so that that makes sense then. And then like in the public one, can yeah. we see it also? OK, so you have like in, in the interior like shots and yeah. do you have any de deployment of uh, the like separate like this prosthesis like in the um, in the public vehicle or is it only like the, the private ones that you have? Uh, uh, what do you mean in terms of deployment? Like uh, multiple, basically, like prosthesis in the public vehicles, because we uh, we see only one. Like uh, we don't see like how it's structured and how it's organized with like multiple prosthesis in the space. Yeah. So uh, here, I mean, it's a little uh, maybe. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, maybe, yes. But this is the captain who kind of controls the ship with his neural network. And these are the other beings which kind of uh, just re re reside upon the, the the surfaces of the, the public vehicle. Like the, yeah. the, the I understand. Um, I, I have a question for you here. Like, uh, why are we? Uh, why, why did you choose to work with such a huge scale? Like in between, because like obviously, like you see, like all these um, prostheses, yeah. they have like so much space in between. I feel that like, that's actually like interesting. Like to see even through some of the other projects. Like before you, you're not the only one like working with like such like really huge spaces like uh, in these vehicles. Um, yeah. Was there? A, a certain like idea behind uh, these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then the intentionality be behind like large public spaces for it, it was not just the public vehicles, but the corpuscles, um, you know, like the spaces that these beings reside in is because uh, I, I kind of attribute like it's like a metaphor for like the bird and, and like the sky, right? If you want to, it's sort of like when you put it, uh, put these beings into habitats or like not habitats, but like spaces architectural defined spaces you still want them to have that sort of comfortability and synthesis that they have with the ocean which is open free expansive and so having the public spaces kind of reflect upon that interior of those reflect upon that um something that we can always kind of try to keep in mind you know because we don't want to constrict these beings or otherwise like free floating within the, the oceans and is your vehicle allowing for water to come inside? Because obviously, like your prosthesis, like in, in your case, like it's yeah. uh, prosthesis that it's. Um, yeah. Yes, so that's the idea basically, like to have like the water like coming inside the vehicle so they can move around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So this is, it's like, I, I uh, like the design of it sort of inspired by sort of like a semi hybrid between a, a motorcycle slash kind of. I, I'm really inspired by both like uh, the uh, like Tron and also uh, Aquaman. There's Aquaman had a lot of kind of really cool and inspiring uh, architectural uh, pieces when it comes to the vehicles. So um, I, I always kind of found it interesting that maybe it, like instead of it being sort of like formal where it's like it just sits upon like it's a normal traditional standard that it's it's like kind of flipped upon that. And you just lay it lay, like the prestige just lays on. I think it's just more comfortable. You traverses through the water still, has that comfortability um, that's kind of reflected within the private vehicle. Yeah, I think that like yeah, that makes sense on the uh, private, but I was just curious more about like the. Um... Yeah, the public vehicle and how oh, yeah. do the, how does the prosthesis really move inside the public mm -hmm. vehicle, especially when it's. Uh... No, OK. OK. Yeah, that that was more like because I feel that this one is incorporating a lot of the logics exactly like that you are embedding from the beginning. But this second piece is that I don't really, you know, like see like how this is going to happen, like for the vehicle to be moving freely, or is it actually like a vehicle that it's, uh, you know, like open to then, you know, like the the water like on inside. So that's a little bit like of some okay. of the questions that are things that like are right off the bat, just you know, okay. making if it makes sense like with your narrative basically yeah thank you guys thank you Pavlina. any other questions hi neither <laughs> um i just want to say uh that it came out really nice uh, i think this was uh, a really uh cool vehicle idea even from the beginning i remember um and i'm just going to comment on the visuals to be honest 
Uh, I like the render, but uh, I actually really like the fact that you wanted to introduce that hexagon pattern, but I would prefer it to be a, a little slightly smaller. Okay. Um, because I think it, it creates that it, this interesting uh, reflection uh, which doesn't feel natural or it just feels plastic to me, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And uh, also like a bit more contrast is missing. Like, um, like I think if there was a bit more contrast on those patterns, you would really understand that there's there's something going on in there, right? So I think uh, it, it's just the Overall, I think it's it's a really unique project. Uh, I think Anya is not today; he, she's not here. But um, the the vehicle, the public vehicle, is looking really good as well. I, I remember the Mid Journey uh, reference images. It's just she actually nailed it, to be honest. But I agree with Pavlina about the interior. Um, we didn't have much time, I think, to discuss on that. But I think it should be developed a bit more. Um, and also, like uh, there was this image that you showed from the interior, lots of light, lots of like white stuff going on. It's just really hard for us to differentiate. Mm -hmm. I wish you had like more images uh, showing us the deployment, just as Pavlina mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that it's a great project, but it's just it's just uh, yeah. a readability, you know. That's is the only thing that's missing at this point. But I think um, it's it's really nice. So thank you so much for your effort. This is a really cool vehicle, really cool project. Oh, thank you, Zainab. Great, appreciate it. Hi, Nether. Hi, Pedro. <laughs> How are you doing? Good, good, good. <laughs> yeah, I agree um, with Zainab and Pavlina regarding the interior, um, so not much to say about it. Um, but keep in mind that when you see this section of the public vehicle, then you see this kind of flat slabs that doesn't look uh, logical. Keep in mind that you are underwater. But then you design this kind of structure for the captain, the captain, and I think th that's more logical when you, if you are underwater. So for me, it's kind of hard to see someone sitting in a chair if yeah. you are underwater. Yeah. But something that you can fix easily, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Apart from that, I was expecting more translucent materials. I know. Yeah. I I know that I were I was worrying yeah. you, worrying you a lot with that thing. Um. But I don't want to kill your computer as well, because I know that it takes more time to render. Mm -hmm. But if that's possible, maybe to in, to include maybe this kind of squid skin texture on your flat white material, it would be nice to see it, honestly. Okay, it yeah. Nice. But apart from that, I think you have here such a good project. You and Anya has a really good project. Well, thank you, Pedro. Thank you for all your, your guidance, consistency with everything. It's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, building kind of on what Pedro was saying, you know, I mean, the Mariana Trench is, is really deep. Like it's dark, probably, too. So one thing, um, I mean, rendering water is going to be brutal. Like, it's just tough. Uh, you have to layer on a lot of effects to really make this uh, feel really compelling. Like, you, even if you look at Aquaman and you were to pull stills, it probably looks somewhat like even cartoonish. Like, they have to go too far to make it feel like it's water, you know, using large amounts of atmospherics, large amounts of um, con context in order to really make you believe that you're underwater. And so um, it's just more work, you know, and uh, I think that's all it is, is stuff to add on and layer on to this. And I wouldn't be afraid um, it, to to do some of these things in post and in Photoshop and things like that in order to be, because it, it can be really difficult to capture an underwater scene and just a straight up rendering, you know. Yeah. Um, unless unless you're like really shooting the moon, it's going to be really tough to uh, to do that. So that that would be my one thought. Um, but yeah, in general, the formwork is really cool. Yeah, I touched on the illumination as well. Like especially if you're so deep, you know, I would really focus on local illumination over global, and uh, that'll really help. I think you know if uh, if all the light of the scene is coming from 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 the building, etc., it's going to make you feel like okay, it's either nighttime or they're underwater, you know. Yeah, so I think that there's just little tricks and uh, more just like the finishing uh, that once you layer on top of this will really will really make it feel contextualized and and, and, and fit with the overall narrative. So. Thank you. Thank you so much.
thank you guys. I think the project needed a little bit more of a push, like for all the comments that uh, the mentors gave you. So I think you guys need a little bit push for the project to be like very like excellent. But overall, like I'm very happy with the results and with the work that you did. So you should be proud of yourself. Yeah, you very, very, very good job. Thank you too. Thank you. Uh, OK, let's see next team. We have B3, we have Michael and Kate. Hello. Hello. Oh. Michael, can we hear you? Can you hear me OK? Yes. Nice, OK. And can you see this? Yes. yes. Ready? Yeah. Over thousands of years, a callous exterior has formed over a pocket of energy in a galaxy far away, creating a barren planet. This planet is largely uninhabited, yet it exudes energy across its landscape. landscape. Roaming the planet are two solemn keepers who have the ability to wield and maintain energy. The dawn keeper is hardy and meaty. The blubbery, mushroom-like forms help to keep this keeper warm and protected. The dust keeper is crunchy and callous, with pinecone prickles protruding out from the core of the keeper. These forms help to catch and store energy in their nooks. Roaming this barren planet are two individual roaming mothers. Each mother a migrating intertwinement of entire ecosystems. The dusk mother alters between dry and dewy. The dusty creatures are like mites and crustaceans across the surface, nuzzling in between dust and air, while the dewy creatures here like to crawl and hop. The Dawn Mother is light and airy with a sense of gravity different from our own. This ecosystem is filled with vascular bubbly tubes with bulbous slimy creatures meandering within. This mother houses the water and winter biomes. Within each mother are two competing ecosystems, living in harmony. As we explore the Dawn Mother, we can see that she is made up of cells, similar to creatures on Earth. These cells multiply and mutate to form intricate cities. There is a mix of soft and hard materials in the city, with the soft appearing to be some sort of gelatinous substrate, while the hard materials feel more like calloused bone. This Dawn Mother truly encapsulates an entire ecosystem that exists somewhere between Arctic and air. As we look closer, we can see that this mother is filled with life and there is movement in her veins. The network is a creature in itself that ebbs and flows with its traveling inhabitants. We see complex networks of membranous bubbly tubes, which interconnect the biomes throughout the mother. This network is filled with creatures that are swimming and transporting nutrients and energy. The Dawn Mother is in a constant state of life and decay, with parts of her decomposing and fossilizing at each moment. The creatures that reside within the Dawn Mother seem to be more nurturing than the Mother herself. Venturing deep into one of these vascular bubbling conduits, we come across the most ancient of creatures. Through his verdant and green tones, we discern the presence of a male. These behemoths outmatch even the mighty Gaia's keepers, soaring through the skies as careers of life themselves, bearing nutrients and energy from biome to biome. Hush now, let us not disturb the celestial dance of the female as she waits her arrival at the dewy biome hub. Beneath their armor and gelatinous substrate, these creatures reveal a callous core that shields and protects the beings they transport with the utmost care. Similar to the skin of a frog, transparent and gooey pockets store patches of energy that maintain the creature's warmth. Behold the membranous tendrils, serving as vital interfaces to the Dawn Mother's energy ecosystem. Swelling with processed energy, these tendrils will eventually pinch off and form vesicles, waiting to be absorbed by the mother's embrace. In vivid hues and bright light, the complete anatomy of these nurturing giants is unveiled a testament to their gentle nature. With immense yet tender fins, these creatures gather and transport smaller creatures, cradling them with grace and care. We can see the difference in body posture showing the personality traits of the males and females. 
Callus and Meaty, the anatomy of these creatures is quite unlike anything we've seen on Earth. It's almost as if they have ecosystems fractalizing inside them. From behind, we can see their gel gelatinous tendrils that drift in the air as they glide like a slow moving blimp, carrying pockets of viscous energy within. We can see the main color differences between the male and female. These tendrils act as an organelle, processing and packaging energy gathered by creatures within. When the time is right, these tendrils will pinch off into energy vesicles to be stored by the mother creature. As we look closer, we see that these creatures are actually mothers in their own way, transporting an entire ecosystem of creatures within. Here we can see the dawn keeper awaiting its arrival at the dawn mother's core. These gentle giants are living embodiments of true symbiosis. We hear a mighty rumble echo through the twilight air as the massive creatures glide past us. The peaceful giants move with calculated grace, scooping out smaller creatures into their colossal fins. Through their actions are sift, swift, they are also gentle, as if cradling a precious treasure. Witnessing their benevolent nature is both awe-inspiring and humbling, a reminder of the delicate balance that exists in the natural world. As we leave behind the frigid and gusty biomes of the floating dawn mother and enter into the dusk mother, we are reminded that there is still so much to be discovered on this barren planet. This mother is made of dozens of biomes intertwined to create a utopia for the creatures in her arid and dewy ecosystems. In the dusk mother, the components have an ancient feel that transcend times itself. The resilient, robust elements are fossilized remains that have withstood harsh conditions. Upon closer inspection, intricate details are apparent as the cells continue to evolve and mature. At the initial stages, it feels like the development of a mere tumbleweed. However, as the process unfolds, patterns and structures emerge. In this view, we catch a glimpse of the luminous network that links together the ever-changing biomes of the Dusk Mother. The network is constantly shifting and evolving, adapting to the growth of new parts and the decay of ancient ones. Looking through the veil of the Dusk Mother as if it were made of glass, we see a radiant web that serves as a railway for creatures great and small. This glowing network threads through the Mother and all her shifting biomes. As we travel through the nooks of the Dusk Mother, we see crustaceans reside within her. As the workhorses of the mother, the male crustacean shoulders the brunt of the heavy lifting, ensuring that the vital energies of the land are distributed equally. Here we see a queen crustacean resting for a moment before she scurries on by. At the core of the crustacean, they're soft and gentle, a creature of love. The crustaceans develop a thick layer of armor that allows her to traverse the harsh and unpredictable terrain between dry and dewy domain. Behold the queen herself, adorned in a shell that is rugged and sandy. The rough texture allows her to confidently transport vital energy through even the driest and dustiest of zones. Segmented and armored, the queen's legs are a testament to her strength and resilience, enabling her to carry even the heaviest of loads upon her delicate toes. The signature of a queen crustacean is her three tails, which curl and sway with effortless grace as she carries her precious cargo across the land. In their natural habitat, we witness the queen crustacean alongside her male counterparts, who are hardy and compact, equipped with formidable claws to aid in their laborious duties. We encounter the Dusk Keeper, fatigued and weary after a long day's journey to the Dusk Mother. With her characteristic kindness, the queen crustacean graciously takes on the task of transporting him to his next destination, a testament to her role as a vital lifeline within this harsh and beautiful world. As we pull away from the Dusk Mother, we discover an array of fuzzy caterpillar-like creatures nestled within her nooks and crannies. In a moment of awe, we witness a male caterpillar traversing a perilous path. Let's give him some space so he can safely pass. In another area, a female caterpillar takes a moment to rest and absorb the soothing lunar light, her rosy red cheeks glowing with added vibrancy. 
The surreal scene is both peaceful and captivating as the nocturnal world of the Dust Mother continues to reveal its secrets. The caterpillars bloom like a delicate flower, their layers of love unfurling one by one. The most pliable layer of the caterpillar is an internal membrane, nurturing budding baby caterpillars within. Chunky, chubby, and chewy feet grant the caterpillars bounce and stretch to allow them to navigate the thorny terrain. Fern-like quills adorn the top of their bodies, rustling in the breeze as they explore. The female caterpillar moves in peace, carrying resources across the mother. Zooming in, we witness a symbiotic ecosystem flourishing within her. As she turns the corner, her speckled face and pigtail ears guide her through the darkness. In full light, her joyous details and spirit are on full display. We witness the caterpillar extending a gracious welcome to the keeper, backing him into her vibrant ecosystem. Inside the caterpillar cavern, the keeper takes a much needed rest as he is transported through the mother's interconnected pathways. Along the network rails, loading hubs allow caterpillars to distribute energy and resources. When crustaceans tire from their work, they can hitch a ride on the caterpillar to rest. Throughout the mother, we witness a bustling hive of male and female caterpillars working together to tirelessly transport vital energy and love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. <laughs> this beautiful ecosystem you've created, uh, like as we always like say, like, uh, you know, it reminds us of a very interesting like National Geographic, you know, like world that it's being described. It, you're going into so much detail, like really uh, combining this uh, supernatural world um, of fairy tales, like with National Geographic and these very uh, interesting creatures and their lives. And you're going into so many details, like and it's just so beautifully put, like with all uh, parts of the materiality and each step of evolution that you're really, really looking into that it really persuades us in a way that this, uh, you know, like world exists. Um, Really well done. I, what I, you know, like I'm happy to see, like with your team, is also how much you guys are really enjoying this process, like of learning and uh, really like having so much fun, like working with each other and growing together. Um, I'm really excited to to see like all these, you know, like parts uh, really coming together. For me. I do have a question about like one of the creatures that it's, um, you know, like a, a, a looking really like. Um, uh, like a lobster, right? Like one of the mothers that uh, it's exactly like that uh, part that uh, you're showing. For me, it might be interesting also because like the the scale and the materiality you're using, like it doesn't feel very welcoming, you know, like to the body. If you know, like that might be something that like you considered about like really having uh, really this body, like, you know, like really resting comfortably uh, because it does feel like that it's an armor, right? Like that it's uh, supposed to really um, shed like this um, uh, this creature, but then like how exactly like this body is like coming? It just doesn't feel very you know like integrated in a way. So it's interesting for me to hear a little bit more about the design process behind this. Yeah, so we have like there's kind of like a seat in it, um, like it's like set up like a chair. I think if anything, what we struggled with more was rigging the keeper to like get him to sit normally um because he's like so has like so many legs and things like that that it was like very difficult to like we imagined how a human would sit on the like crab but then as soon as we like dealt with our keeper we realized like there was a bit of a disconnect between like joints um so i think that's where like our struggle maybe most like shown through that if we'd done earlier we might have designed the whole thing slightly differently but no, no, yeah, I totally understand. What I would say is definitely like, you know, when you're creating these creatures, like again, like making them different, right? Like from what the inspiration was or the initial inspiration animal, right? Like to really differentiate and to rethink like a lot of these aspects is 
uh, really the challenge here, right? Like, so for me, it does feel a lot like the real animal, right? Like looking into it because of the materiality, the colors. So, you know, like, the re like really rethinking about it and really obsessing the details in order to, you know, take it a step further into something that is really not so easily recognizable. I think it would have been like, you know, like even yeah. a level up. But other than that, really, that's just a conversation about like one of the pieces, right? But uh, other than that, like obviously, like you guys are doing like, a fantastic job. Thank you. I totally agree with Pavlina about uh, the comment. Um, also, uh, also, like the project is uh, very unique, very interesting. It's totally different from everything else that we see in the presentation. So congratulations. It's also uh, very well connected and cohesive with the previous uh, chapters. I only like the, the only uh, one comment that I may add is uh, about the presentation. Maybe you could add um, a bit of uh, titles or text or something like that 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 it that makes the presentation a bit um, easier to understand for people who see the project for the first time. This is the only one I would add. Thank you so much. Hi, Michael and Kate. <laughs> so thank you so much for the presentation. Well, um, I think um, this was one of the projects where we had most of the fun, right? <laughs> so. Uh, one thing that I found really successful is that your project overall has so many organic materials, organic, you know, like it's so rich in terms of organic elements. So I was like so curious how the renders are going to come out, but I think they came out really beautifully. They, they look so romantic and uh, the fact that you're able to differentiate one element from the other, I think it's a success. So um, and just because I know that there are so many efforts that you put each, put on each of these elements and vehicles, uh, it's also a really uh, like really successful thing for me. And the fact that you were like so eager to learn new things and uh, the joy on your faces when you learn new thing on Houdini was really um, valuable for me. So. In terms of that, I think, uh, and the fact that you both worked really good with each other, I think that's also another thing to mention. But overall, it came out really nice. So thank you so much um, for the efforts and uh, hard work you've put in on this project. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, guys. I want to thank you for the additional effort you did in order to create the additional vehicles. So I think that's a huge, huge success for you. Um, Apart from that, I like the textures. The only thing that I think it may be missing is a proper diagram for occupancy. Um, maybe not, maybe not a so technical diagram, but maybe more like a biology diagram type mm -hmm. in a way. Because I think that's the only thing that was missing. I know that you have images, um, but I was expecting like the real diagram at the end. That that just that my only comment. Apart from that, I think this is a really beautiful story and project at the same time. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, PJ. Yeah, I don't. Um, I don't have much in the way of comments. It was really cool. It was a really fun narrative uh, and 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 story that you put together. Um, to the earlier comment, just to make sure that this presentation works without you as well. Um, so if someone just sees this board, make sure it's also really really compelling and uh, that they can follow your train of thought. Um, but uh, yeah, in general, it was it was really cool. Um, the only other thought I, I might play with the backplate image, the um, the background that you're using right now. Maybe try uh, a couple more. Um, I think it works as is, but I wonder if there might be a slightly stronger um, background noise image that that might work, especially from when you're zoomed out in the presentation. It, it, it looks really good. I'm, my worry was when you were really close and you have these like very nice, uh, almost perfectly crisp renderings against it. Uh, I don't know. I might I might play around a little bit, but um, regardless, I, I, I think it still works, but you might be able to to make it work just a slight bit better. Um, but yeah, that's about it. 
Thank you, guys. I totally you. agree about the the base background. Like, yeah. uh, I was about also to mention, but forgot about it. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I think we talk about the the text. Uh, yeah, they're gonna add it uh, today or tomorrow. Thank you for the work. This was the only group I I, ha I had to limit the time with the tutors <laughs> because we just gonna take uh, of a lot of time. But yeah, thank you for the effort, for the questions, for all the work that you put in, and what a great way to to wrap up the the world that you have created. So thank you, thank you again. And uh, let's have a ten minutes break. Can we uh, continue with B five? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's me, yes? Yes, Luca. <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Luca, and today I'd like to take you to outer space to the mining colony S2001 HAL4. Um, and I'm going to show you its two vehicles. Um, one is an interstellar transporter of the 6CAT series and the B45 shrimp bike. Uh, once upon a time in a far off corner of the solar system, a group of humans had established a space colony near a large cluster of asteroids in the midst of a field of similar celestial bodies. In this space colony, the inhabitants have made the transition from fully biological beings to cyborgs, blending technology with their organic bodies to enhance their physical and mental capabilities. The beings of the space colony are hardy and resourceful people, skilled at adapting to the challenges of life in a harsh and unforgiving environment. They are also skilled miners, using their advanced technologies to extract valuable minerals and energies from the asteroids in the field that also power their vehicles. They live in an interconnected space station where they have mastered the use of force field technology to protect themselves from the harsh environment of space. Each station centers around various energy cores that also serve as harbors for larger spaceships. <coughs> to move between their space stations, the beings developed large interstellar transporters. This model is the 6CAT. With its cabins in the front and its large cargo bay, it is a key infrastructure to their cosmic success. Uh, the transporter consists of a large propulsion system in the back surrounding a reaction chamber where asteroid dust is turned into energy. The cargo bay and complex is almost... Uh, sorry? No, it's a puzzle. Excuse me? Someone say something, sorry. Um, the cargo bay and compass is almost the entire length of the ship. In the front... Um, sorry. In the front, six cabins can seat up to 20 passengers each. The propulsion system on this model consists of eight turbines that can reach up to four times light speed in under 50 seconds. Close to space stations, the transporters move on a light guided highway system that lies over the habitats. The ships dock to the station's energy cores where goods and passengers and fuel can be exchanged. They do this by using force field technology. When a ship comes close to a docking station, they form a bridge connection with their force fields. <clears throat> the hull consists of complex technology and piping systems and offers optimal protection against radiation. Uh, the same skin system is also used on the, sorry, on the ball field powered 45 series or shrimp bike. It is made for individual movement inside the stations. A single rider can hold on to its steering handles and race through zero gravity. 
A force field windshield protects the rider from floating asteroid pieces within the stations as it rests comfortably on the back of the bike. The antennas and the windshield can fold down as it's stored and enters hibernation mode. Other systems such as the energy ball and turbines are also shut off. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. I enjoyed a lot your presentation and all the pro <laughs> all the aspects of it. I love the vehicles that you're creating, especially the Harley Davidson of space. It shows that you you enjoyed a lot the process, and um, I love that like you're thinking parametrically, like, like through all aspects of your work, and you're incorporating a lot of these logics. I know that also Houdini was new to you, so. It's great to see that uh, you're incorporating all these logics and learning you and really like pushing yourself into again like a new new territories and having like such a cohesive like story from the beginning. Um, I think that like exactly like some of these like uh, moments would be enhanced maybe if again the prosthesis was you know like uh, incorporated a little bit yes. better like uh, through the visuals and how it like really blends in with the with the vehicle. Yeah, I know you have Casper there, but you know like the actual prosthesis may be good to see like how it actually like blends with the vehicle because then it becomes one right so i know that we've spoken about that like um you have the time to incorporate that uh, in your future uh in your future uh project and also i would love to see like more on the public vehicle again like sections and a little bit like of how it actually like works inside do we have some more views on that or is it mostly exteriors? It's mostly exteriors. I unfortunately I didn't get as far on the interiors as I wanted to. Yeah. So I mean there's that one section where you can see the, the connection to the to the station. Yeah, um, I would love to see really like inside, especially this section, even incorporating some of those like seats or how it's really like operating and working. I think it's really going to give a glimpse of this, you know, like um, of this vehicle and how it actually like works. But other than that, I think the the the, the work is beautiful. So you work, uh, you're missing really just a small amount of elements really like to make it. Uh, really to to its best um, way like in order like to complete the story and uh, for us to see all the aspects thank you luca beautiful work thank you hi luca um i think this is a really good job i just was expecting uh, I remember that we discussed the idea of distributing bikes in the interior part of the public vehicle around around the inner walls i remember that I don't know what happened with that because I I really like that the idea to have this kind of inner structure in the middle to put people and to displays big bikes all around the, the inner faces. Um, I like that idea, but I don't know what happened there. But apart from that, I think this is a good project. Personally speaking, I wouldn't I wouldn't use the same texture in all the pieces because I think I think that you are using the, the exact same texture or and pattern in you know in, in all of your both bikes. Uh, vehicles, I, I wouldn't do that, um, but but that's just a personal opinion. But apart from that, I think this is a really good job. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. the interior is definitely something I, I still really want to do. It was just time wise, I had so many but, things, and then in the end, I just yeah, I know, I know, I know that. But I mean, you, you had the idea, you, you had the idea. Yeah, for we, sure. did, we discussed yeah. the idea, and I thought it was working properly. You just need to develop it. Hello, Luca. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I was also expecting that interior because I remember we had like a conversation on that, but it's OK. Like I, 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 I think you, you should totally develop that further, uh, even though you, you couldn't make it for this presentation, but it's fine. I really like the way that you worked like really systematically, and I can see that uh, it came out really nice. So all these details really, really push the project further, I think. But uh, I kind of agree with Pedro at some cases, like uh, from a far away perspective, it, it seems really interesting. But when you get into the details, like you might get a bit overwhelmed with the same pattern going over and over again. 
But uh, on the other hand, like uh, the way that this uh, private vehicle forms itself, I remember it was based on a flow. Uh, and the, the whole thing is like really unique. And I think the, the renders are like really nice. But I wish to see like that one golden shot where you have everything in one in just one picture, not just like uh, a circulation diagram, but where in an image where you had both, you know, like private and the public working it together. I wish to see that one image, but overall, I think it's a really nice progress. Thank you so much for the effort. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Luca, I personally enjoy your project so much, like all the thoughts behind those details and textures. They're really interesting and super fun. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, yeah, I don't have a ton to add. Really, really cool. I especially the, uh, the shrimp bike is super compelling. It's very cool. Uh, I love the use of texture. It's a great example of um, enabling everyone, regardless of uh, even some of the lighting, like you can really, really pick up the form super, super well. And how you kind of layered these textures enables like even your close ups to look a bit fantastic, just as, as as much as, you know, some of these far away shots. So great job there. You know, I think it adds a lot. Um, yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I think to everyone's point, you know, the uh, the scale of the, the bigger vehicle, I think once you add some of the interior shots, that'll really help. Um, but yeah, uh, some type of scale or you could even maybe contextualize some of those diagrams like with some type of background stars or something like this, you know, that could help uh, uh, ground it a little bit, um, but very, very cool. Thank you. Thanks for all the comments. I, I would say like the project is at a uh, very high level. I would move on maybe more on the presentation size, uh, like the way that you present the project so that it gets people more involved into it. The work is there, uh, so it's say like a few touches here and there. I think the interiors would really add up to the project, but overall, uh, great use of the software. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Luca. Richard. Uh, let's move on to the next team, which is B6. We have Victor and uh, Mauricio. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Our team is made up of Almira, Mauricio, and Marcel Victor, and today Mauricio and I will present to you the fourth chapter of Savo. Savo is the story of love, mystery, vengeance, and rebellion, the story of the eternal conflict of good versus evil. It all begins when Starry, a clone from the year 2914, travels to the year 2405 in order to change the course of the future. He falls in love with Kara, and they conceive a beautiful baby girl, Savo. After Starry is caught sabotaging the Virta lab, he's forced to flee to safety, taking both Kara and the baby with him. During the escape, Starry is killed, but Kara and their daughter flee on his space vessel. In the year 2914, Savo and her mother crash on planet Earth, with her mother dying on impact. Maestro Ido takes Savo under his wing and protects her as his own. As the years and decades passed, society struggled with the environmental disasters, famine, sea level rise, and global warming. Coastal cities have flooded, landlocked cities have scorched in the sun, and humans have been forced to adapt and sustain. Classism is at its worst, as those living in poverty have been forced to the water, while those in power have modified the human genome. The Vieta people leave the flooded cities and build Lumo, the city of light. Tall and white skyscrapers, reminiscent of the purity and godliness are erected in honor of the demigods the Virta have become. The Mara, on the other hand, have adapted to their water city Malhela, becoming one with the sea through a blending of mutation and augmentation. Tensions between the Virta and Mara rise as the Virta enforce their superiority, causing an imbalance of power and resources. But Savo is no longer watching. She prepares to fight for her right to live freely. This is Hela, 
the result of the most recent genetic experiments of the Virta. With superpowers and technological enhancement, he is built for war. He and the other troopers live in this structure, lightweight and undurable. Designed for the flight occupants with many openings and entryways. And previous interiors that speak to their pride. More recently, the Birta built a settlement near to the water to tighten their grip on the rebellious Maru. With the space for a show battles and the day to day life. The work of the previous chapter was a user to create uh, the inspiration for the battleship and a single occupancy trooper aircraft. With the sketch, we clarify the build up of those ships. Use Maya to generate a base volumes and how they need to refine and texture the models. The docking station at the waterfront are inspired by a platform based design for maximum flexibility. Our networks were supposed to be split in a main system and a secondary small one. Fitting for Lumu, the city of light, we explore light trails. With the integration of infrastructure and deployment of battleships, the military presence reached its final stage. Virgin soldiers move freely between key points and keep a steady lookout over the water and the lingering dangers. This is the Hornet, Virta's main battleship. Before each deployment, the soldiers recite what they believe to be the truth. The Hornet features two weapons and three support drones. We might come back to the gist later. In battle, a lighting ray at the front and the electric mortar on the back are used for attack. The ship is made from three main layers, the protective shell, the inner level architecture and the deck. In total, the ship can transport a division of 50 soldiers spread over the three levels. They can drop into the enemy area through the hole inside. The mortar is foldable and uses its metallic properties to create a powerful discharge. The ornamentation around the wings provides structural stability during rapid maneuvers. The propulsion is based on hydrogen directly collected from the air and transformed into the fuel for the system. A captain and two operators control the Hornet at all times. The drones, called bumblebees, are stored inside the ship. They can transport cargo or injured Virta, or act independently to scout the area. This is WASP, Virta single occupancy aircraft, a very powerful and fast lethal weapon. We're going to show this later. It is highly maneuverable and I can uh, sustain major impact. The main components are the body, the reinforcing windshield, and a protective shield at the bottom. The WASP has uh, two powerful uh, light rays, capable of uh, destroying anything that gets in its way. Made from high-end uh, material, that is done extreme temperatures and integrates razor sharp and aerodynamic line details. The bottom of the aircraft has a super resistant shell to protect it from ground attack. A powerful hydrogen jet makes the WASP the faster in the air. The entire aircraft has a very sleek design for the best aerodynamic performance. There are three types of docking stations spread strategically across the settlement. 
They receive the rear end of the Hornet with grippers through a magnetic field. The lower levels are used as parking decks for the wasps. The single unit docks make the three public spaces of the amalgamation accessible for everyone. The two unit dock at the base gate east is used by ships that secure the perimeter. From here, all ships fly up and around the entire settlement until they reach the main dock on the other side. The main dock can receive up to four hornets and a dozen of troopers. It functions as the central station and provides connections to all other docks. The wasps are supported by a layered slot structure that recharges the floating gliders. The network system is based on a light rails that create a constant air of flight for the ships to travel. The true pair network is mostly hided. It uh, runs across the mountain wall trail from um, both base docks are converged in a single speedway that are connected to the inner system of the settlement. This section of the network connects uh, the base docks uh, to the main traffic line. A few trails uh, diverge to connect the administration facilities. The main line connects uh, the three public spaces. Another line diverges uh, westward for uh, troopers to access the training facilities. The most distant paths reach toward the barrack of the settlement. The external infrastructure is much more simple. Bigger groups can use the harness to reach public spaces through the network. This is the protection line, and a harness must travel this line at all times for a defense purpose. Lumo glows in the darkness, standing as a beacon of hope and a reminder of the Virgin's power. Savo knows it will take a monumental effort to bring down the corrupt regime. This was Savo Chapter 4. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, team. Thank you so much for the glorious work. <laughs> it's wonderful to see the progress and like how everything is, uh, you know, tying together with previous chapters. I love like how you guys like are working together and it seems that everything is cohesive. Uh, for me, one of the things that definitely like, you know, like it's a challenge, right? Like for this project itself and it's always, uh, you know, like difficult to get, but it's the depth of field, right? Like in just uh, what is really on the foreground, what is on the background because of the richness of the pro project itself and all these layers that are coming together. I feel that on some of the images, like you were, you know, more successful than others, like to, to show this depth and this complexity and really to focus on, you know, the vehicle and on really the parts that you were supposed to, you know, really accentuate and really focus on. So because again, like all the complexity of the work, but other than that, I feel that everything is tied together and that uh, you were able really like to, to work together throughout these different vehicles and really uh, create this uh, cohesive, uh, you know, and unified language uh, on the, the vehicle design. So thank you guys for the beautiful work. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Victor and Mauricio, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Oh, should we watch? <laughs> okay, okay, I'll I'll comment after. <laughs> no, you can comment right over it. I think. No, no, let's just go on with them. <laughs> we want to enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. Moment of silence, please. <laughs> So yeah, this basically okay. just shows the deployment of the drones and the, the mortar. And the other one too, maybe.
So yeah, you, you can go ahead. All right. So uh, I think uh, both of the vehicles are really well presented. And I, I appreciate that you didn't, even though I know that you tried so many things on the like the vehicle itself, uh, I love the fact that you didn't overload everything apart from what they actually need. So that is what makes them, you know, really uh, consistent. Um, I love that uh, each of the vehicles are like functional, but they came out really nice aesthetically as well. I love those diagrams that you try to explain everything, but I wish to see um, a, a cyborg inside the public vehicle. Um, I think apart from diagram, it would be much easier or much better in my opinion. Not these are these are nice, but I, I would I wish to see some renders inside the public vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, I think it's really nice. I really also appreciate the effort that you've put in in the network systems. The fact that you've managed to solve each and every one of them like separately, I think they deserve an appreciation. So, like I, I really like these the light trails. I think they're they look really cool. Uh, yeah, nothing to add to be honest. This is, this is really cool. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, guys. Hi. From my side, I agree with Seinep. Basically, regarding the, the occupancy diagram, I think there is some information missing there, but you can solve that easily. Um, it's, not a, it's not a problem. Apart from that, I congratulate you guys for the effort and how uh, I, really like, I really like how consistent your language is. So from the from day one, from chapter one till this point, it's your your work has been really consistent, and that's something that is really positive in that way. I will, even even colors are being consistent, materials are being consistent. So that that's that's a good approach from you. Um, I honestly like the world that you are creating right now. Even the style that you have, this comic style that you have to communicate your work, it's really nice. It's really nice. So thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations, guys. It's an amazing project, really beautiful. All the visuals are very strong, and I totally agree with Pedro about the consistency of the project since the beginning, since uh, chapter one. So thank you so much for sharing and congratulations. Thank you. Sure. Do you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, cool. Uh, Congratulations, guys. Amazing project. Uh, as everyone said, very consistent, but I will be a little bit of a uh, devil here. <laughs> I think your occupancy diagrams and diagrams per se need a little bit more love because you show an amazing work, amazing detail. And after that, like the level of, it feels like the, the level of quality of work going down and after that going back again so you definitely love to do renders but you don't love you yeah. don't like to do diagrams so if you kind of tune them a little bit to the same detailization at good level it will be even more cohesive story because during the diagrams i kind of lost the story because like what but yeah amazing project all right thank you thank you Yeah, speaking to the um, to the work itself, like it's really, really cool. Um, to the earlier point, or maybe it was even the first point about how some of the images can feel a little bit flat, um, and 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 some ways to really really help this, especially of I think the station itself, like if uh, this one in the bottom right, you know, it has depth of field for days, but um, like how how can we help? Uh, pull out some of these images um, and I think one one area especially on some of the station and the docking that I think another layer to add might be just a, a couple more details you know that'll really help pull out what is in the foreground what is in the background and, and push you know the background away so um, that's the only thought in terms of uh, helping in, in improve some of the readability of the imagery and um, getting it to really uh, come across. But in general, it's it's very cool. It's a it's a really cool world that you've created. So. Thank you. Thank you guys. Wonderful working with you. Uh, a good wrap of your world, which is great. And uh, 
Yeah, I think with some of the feedback, you can really tune it for the presentation in the in the summer. Good yeah. job on that. Yeah, all the work pays off. So, job. And let's go to the next team, which is Prashant and Amit. Thank you, guys. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. On the, uh, the screen. Yeah. Whenever you're ready, Anita. OK. Hello, we are Anita and Prashant, and we represent the world of Oz. Oz is a place set in the present time, in a different universe where human interaction is not dominant, and where diverse animal and plant life forms have been permitted to evolve. It is known to many as the Outer Zone, and to others as Oz. Our story begins with a young girl named Dahlia who falls through a wormhole and by inadvertently killing the Dark Queen, she sets in motion a series of events that could change the utopian existence of this new world to a dystopian one. Only the wizard can guide Dahlia to reverse her misfortune. So in chapter one, Prosthesis, we selected the wizard and we modified his body to incorporate various human changes, which we thought would be facilitated by both the environment and his role as a magical being, warrior, and protector. Looking at functionality of the corpuscle in the previous chapter, it serves as the nerve center for the community of gnomes and other animal life forms. Each bulb of the corpuscle often contains more than one room, and the tall structure includes the wizard's lab, great hall, and the wizard's bedroom. Moving on to the design journey for the vehicles. Within our design journey for the vehicles, we began with mid journey and gravitated towards structures which embraced unique elements of the prosthesis, such as his spine, considered its functional uses for protection and battle as well. When we look at the private vehicle, the function of the private vehicle is primarily for personal use and also serves as the working vehicle for the farming gnomes. The capacity of the vehicle is between one to five gnomes. The rear of the vehicle incorporates the spine and structure, which is inspired by the spine of the wizard. The main body of the private vehicle is a reflection of the shapes found in the environment and is partially inspired by the shape and the aerodynamic design of a bird. When we look at the public vehicle, the public vehicle is for all the creatures of the community and the wizard as well. It is primarily used for transport of the community inhabitants. The public vehicle is further used when the wizard wants to transport several of the gnomes between locations. The capacity of the public vehicle is up to 50 passengers. With the help of magic and their diverse knowledge of building, the gnomes built this vehicle. This is the detail here of the view of the pipes in which magic flows. The magic converts through the engine and fuels the system. Moving on to the networks, there is a public and a private network. In reference to these networks, the networks are fueled by the power of the wizard and the magical blue ore, which is embedded throughout the community. The public network is a combination of hubs which serve as an underground and above ground source of transportation, similar to a subway or the Chicago L system, which moves both above and below ground. These networks serve as the inspiration for the creation of this one. In the community, the gnomes and other creatures maintain their own private network, which permits them to move easily between living quarters, work, and other communal areas. The paths of travel within Oz are a combination of vine-like pipes which permit vehicles to move easily between hub stations just as one would use the subway stations, but this system, it uses vehicles. The public network also provides for extended travel where the vehicles can be placed into travel bubbles, which are programmed to move between locations and is primarily used for long distance travel, such as travel to the Sun Hub. When we move on to the legend, here are some of the elements where we see the transportation system, such as the pipe entrance exit, the Sun Hub, as well as other hubs and docking stations, which are inspired by nature. 
This also includes the Vine Networks and the Vine Network Tower. Looking at the parts catalog, this is the parts catalog, which helps to define the various elements within the environment. This is mainly comprised of planetary elements, plants, water elements, and various structures. When we start to look at the exploded diagram, the exploded diagram provides a better view of the elements within the community as a whole and of how they are arranged within the amalgamation. So when we look at a close up of a hub, this here is a close up of the public hub and of the network flowing through it. Additionally, this is a second close up of a private hub in the environment. And here we have an overall shot of a render of the complete system. And with that, that concludes our presentation. We look forward to you joining us in the next chapter of Oz. Thank you. Hey guys, thank, thank you. you so much for the presentation. Yeah, that um, it was a, an interesting chapter for you guys. Also, it challenged your, you know, perception and learning of Houdini. Uh, I'm happy to see that everything came together uh, for the presentation. Like a lot of uh, details, a lot of aspects that like we weren't able to see like uh, throughout. Uh, you know, like of course when uh, also like the um, tutors were still here, but uh, you really pushed through and really delivered. So congrats on that. Uh, something that I would really like you to guys like to work on is consistency throughout um, the rendering, the presentation, like, uh, you know, like from beginning to end, because there are just like so many different materials and colors and just like renderings that, you know, like they, they just don't work towards your advantage and the storytelling and Obviously, you can see like this, like through some of the other presentations where everything is like cohesive from beginning to end. With this being said, obviously, if you have the assets built throughout these uh, different chapters, like it's a matter of like really re-rendering and really reviewing some of this, um, you know, like um, aspect of how really like to best visualize those in order to tell the story in the best possible way, especially when, you know, we are talking about something that's very unique again to your presentation. Uh, I appreciate a lot like the details that you're showing, especially like with this like really like zoomed in like micro details. They're absolutely stunning. I love like what you're showing like with them. I would love to see more about the vehicles and their functionality also from, you know, like the inside, um, you know, like with more sections like of the vehicles. To understand them uh, better and uh, the other aspect of the work is also like the communication systems in the space like of the system i feel that they are not as convincing to me of how really things like move along or how things are really like you know like uh, being merged or really like you know functioning within your world but again like uh, Great step, great progress. Um, keep going, right? Like it's just like again, this is not the end. This is just a step towards uh, you, like really like finding your voice and like uh, creating all this like storytelling throughout all these chapters towards the end. So you have plenty of time and opportunities like to incorporate any comments really like uh, moving forward. But thank you for really pulling everything together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Balvina. Hi guys. Um, Hi. Thank you. Thank you a lot for the effort. Um, I see that you you changed some part of your vehicles, which I think is nice. Yes. But probably I was they not re expecting. Every, they re every yes, I I see. I see. I, thanks for the effort, honestly. Um, and thanks for the patience as well. And probably I was I was not expecting metallic materials in your world, uh, but I think. <laughs> We discuss a lot of material, the, the material thing, but I was not expect I was not expecting materials. I, I really thank you. The fact uh, I'm happy with the fact that you add more details, and I think it's fine. But I think you sh you should manage your materials better. And I and I think we can even discuss that later because you can you can um, rearrange, change your materials, which is fine. Um, I don't remember if you showed the uh, occupancy diagrams. I don't think so. Um, 
so yeah. if you, yeah if you don't i would like you to, to to make it because we also discussed that a lot so i think you you can do it easily and i think in the networks there is something missing because of the fact that you create more additional structures so as you have so much different structures i was not expecting such a simple network so i was expecting more complex network one above the other because you have different types of structures um that but that that's just a comment um unless you reduce the amount of stru uh, the structures you have right now. because for, for I agree. now for me for now for me when you when you have when you show your your network in in general it's hard to it's hard to read it in a way because you have so much different things going on at the same time and then you just show one or two networks so it's hard to you know to blend those ideas in a way but I think you can do it. I think you can do it because you, you have the ideas there. You have it. It was just yep. the thing which we had discussed in the like the whole two weeks of uh, our um, um, like development of the project that uh, the structures and the project it sort of is uh, based on this uh, sci-fi, uh, not sci-fi, but a magical story. So they are sort of like discontinued, connect, not connected with each other. And that was the uh, major uh, issue which we had to tackle. And uh, but yeah, I agree with you uh, on the uh, comment that uh, it's a lot and we we, we will we might uh, like rethink in terms of uh, the number of stru structures in uh, further development. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. But I really, it's, it's a really good job that you did. Thank you so much, thanks, guys. Thanks Thank you. Hello, Anita and Prashant. Thank you so much for the presentation. I really enjoyed actually. And uh, I remembered that you were in a really hot spot, hard spot uh, regarding to developing these vehicles. Uh, it was a challenge for everybody, I think, <laughs> in the in the chapter. But I'm really, really happy to see uh, these results today. Um, I think these are the best ones that you've got so far. Um, I would still, you know, make some changes. For example, like for the public week, I would I would elongate that wing a bit more because looking at the reference image, I think that was a really um, like a standout element or you know like a very specific element uh, in the design. So, but but looking at the details, I think the details really made it so nice. And also really like the fact that you've kind of like taken as a reference and you interpreted it into something else, but it still feels very similar. So I really find it uh, really successful in that term. What is missing for me in the public vehicle is the interior, the occupancy, you know, uh, uh, because just because it's public, I don't know, like it's just, I wish that you would have added more details or renders from the interior. Um, uh, regarding, yeah. yeah, go ahead, sorry. No. Okay. Uh, it's just that uh, I was not uh, like, I mean, it was so crunching at time wise um, that, but yes, um, we need to like do the interior part. So yeah, de deliver. definitely go back to the design, but I think it's going really nice um, that you really understood the assignment. It seems like that. So regarding to the Anita's design, I think uh, it's also same for her. I like uh, what I like about the reference ones is the that there was this differentiation between the materials, but uh, in the Anita's design, the private vehicle, um, I wish to see that differentiation as well. But as a form, I think she nailed it as well. Um, and one thing that is missing also the interior, but I'm thinking in this time for time frame, that's the best that you could do. Like I, I see that there is a render, but still uh that occupancy like I, I wish to see a cut you know like a cutout or a section mm -hmm. from the side that, that would that would be wonderful and regarding to the network system i totally agree with pedro i was really ex i got really excited especially this about um uh, this parts catalog i think it was a good start i wish everything was uh proceeding with these you know diagrams but uh, in the beginning, like you've introduced, let me just, I'm also on the narrow, you've introduced some renders, like a couple of renders that are like so different in terms of the color palette. So 
uh, it's really hard for us to read or follow you. But um, also, like, you have so many elements. I think this needs more attention. Uh, like maybe not just a 3D pop diagram, but like section wise, because you have a system that works from the bottom to the top. I think a section would be nice as well. Just try to include uh, everything as much as you can to really explain it. Uh, but I think that parts catalog was a great start for that. But yeah, it's just these renders a bit hard for me to read. Um, even though you've you've added some ambition to you know um, make some certain things or certain you know networks obvious, but it just feels a bit you know yeah hard to read as, as again. But overall, it's a really nice progress. I'm really happy to see this progress from both of you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Zena. Thank you. Yeah, no, nothing to add. From my side, um, the close-ups show that like you can you can really uh, make very very compelling imagery. So I think um, being able to uh, to take this and, and apply you know that uniform voice to the project as a whole, and you'll be in great shape. Definitely. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks thank for you. all the comments. Uh, yeah. Thank you guys for the for the effort in the last few days. Like. I know you all spent a lot of time in the lab, but yeah, you managed to pull off. So great. So now it's time to push even more. Yeah. Uh, of course, after the break to to really develop the world that you had like created, which is uh, insane. So yeah, let's yeah. thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. OK, let's see. The next team is Clark. It will be nine. Hello, let me share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? I'm assuming that's yes. OK, um, hello, uh, my name is Clark Cheng and welcome to the world. Welcome to the world of exploration beyond harnessing the energy for survival. This is the story of a distant planet where creatures and the environment evolve together, transforming into a glowing landscape fueled by the power of the crystals. The story begins on an icy planet where a mutation of creatures started to harness the energy of a glowing crystal at the heart of the planet. The environment itself was evolving along with them, transforming into a glowing landscape of crystal and light. These creatures adapt into the environment of what you see today, the prosthesis. The prosthesis is a creature that has learned to harness the power of the crystals, the very fabric that began to shift around them. The once dull rocks and earth began to pulse with energy, giving off a radiant glow that illuminated the creatures' paths. Path. The creatures reveled in their glowing world, exploring the many wonders and basking in the vibrant light. They built towering structures made from the same glowing material that surrounds them. These creatures eventually inhabited the very form that kept them alive, the corpuscle. The formation of the shell and crystals were a necessary evolution towards an energy source and protection from the harsh exterior environment. The very air itself was infused with the power of the crystals. It hummed with a strange energy, cracking with electricity and radiating with light. The communities mutated, mutated from the derivative of the base form, grown, stretched, distorted into the forms you see. While different in form, all of them derived from the origin, the corpuscle. These started to change as it started to shrink, mutate into forms more basic and abstract from the base form itself. These forms, led to small communities that were sparsely made through areas found found as the savior areas these communities while different in form all used the evolution evolution of part as it was optimal for the life around it and thus the formation of the community was born for what these creatures call home the design process involved to create the perfect vehicle was challenging as their environment was details such as hard shells were vital for the protection and soft interior to match the familiarity of where they reside. The design process led through many journeys of iterations and workflow to create the optimal vehicle, vehicle stations and networking to connect them all together into one cohesive environment. The Cosmic Goldfish, the private vehicle. The Cosmic Goldfish is not your typical private vehicle. It's a rocket-based vehicle that is designed to fly long distances and is shaped like, as you can known by the name, a majestic goldfish. 
The vehicle is a true work of art with his, tr with his two powerful black engines that provide the necessary thrust for takeoff for and flight. And soft air and small and the reach the incredible speeds. A sense of aerodynamic of the engines are fused to kind of almost to keep the stability. Traveling to the other side of this world. Goldfish is a perfect choice and the ultimate the, the Polar Express. Um, the Soft Rail Express a kind transportation. Unlike or simplistic track that has been grown and creating a truly organic to the amalgamation mechanical and organic elements The Soft Rail Express is a perfect choice for anyone who wants to experience a cutting edge mode of transportation that seamlessly blends technology with nature. With its unique design and impressive capabilities, this public vehicle is sure to provide a memorable and comfortable ride for all passengers. The overall public and private network is a complex system that, com that connects various components of the site and the amalgamation, allowing for seamless communication and operation between different entities. The amalgamation, while its advanced technology and advanced capabilities is connected to the private networks, allowing for secure and reliable communication and operation of the private vehicles, such as the Cosmic Goldfish. On the other hand, the site and the crystallized base are, base are connected to the public network, which provide a robust infrastructure for the operation of the public transportation systems, such as the Software Express. Together, these networks provide a comprehensive solution for transportation and communication needs, catering both private and public transportation requirements. This system is a testament on the powers of technology and innovation, bringing together the best of both worlds, providing efficient, safe, and reliable transportation for the entire community. The private station that holds the Cosmic Goldfish. This station is specifically designed to recharge the vehicle through large-scale wireless charging, which keeps the vehicle floating in the air and ready for its next flight. The Cosmic Goldfish is a powerful rocket-based vehicle that requires a lot of energy to, uh, to function properly, which is why the private station is equipped with state-of-the-art technology to provide it with the necessary power. The station is placed where the vehicle can be stored safely and securely, knowing that it will properly re be recharged and maintained for the next adventure thus creating an overall sense of style and unique option for your vehicle to be, always be in tip-top shape. The public station. The public station for the Softrail Express is to provide a seamless, comfortable experience for the passengers using it. The station, the station is made from by manipulating the crystal growth in order to provide a station that is grown from the ground, creating a natural and organic environment that seamlessly blends with the surrounding exterior landscape. The station is equipped with energy pods that provide power to the Soft Rail Express and other public vehicles that use this unique track-based transportation system. Passengers can, can easily board and disembark from vehicles, and the station provi provides a comfortable and safe environment while they wait for their ride. And so the creatures of the glowing landscape continue to evolve, their world shifted, changing around them. They learn to use the power of the crystals wisely, harnessing their energy for the betterment of their society and their world. And their planets shine brighter than ever before, a testament to the incredible power of the crystal energy and the creatures that had learned to harness it. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, great, Hi. great project. I'm very happy to see it like all completed. Did you sleep I am too. though? <laughs> I, yes, I did. I did sleep Whoa. eventually. Okay. So definitely that's, like that's really my couch. like <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so Nana, beautiful work, really like Clark, like uh, I'm super excited to see like all this like coming together, just so imaginative, like it, you're really turning it around and then literally like last like couple of weeks, but like you've just added so many elements. Uh, you just like feel that it feels that, like you've had so much fun like with the whole storytelling. I love how you're selling the vehicles, you know, like and uh, how you're really like telling all these stories and thinking about this, all these aspects of the design. Uh, it really feels very, very well done and cohesive like and uh, I really like applaud you for really making this a like, huge leap because I feel that this was really a huge chapter for you where you really shown a lot of like what you're capable of. So really uh, I applaud you for this like huge, huge, really like step forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing and thank you so much for <coughs> the hard work. Thank you. Hello, Clark. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, really nice Hi. progress. I uh, remember like the last time we left this project till here, I think really nice improvement. I really like the fact that you've considered the scale of your system and it seems like you've managed everything in a very proper way, uh, including the docking uh, stations. Like uh, I really like how funky this project is. I really like the color scheme. Uh, this renders and visuals, I think they they look really nice. So, but one thing that is missing for me is the interior. Like I, I mm -hmm. appreciate the diagrams, but I think especially for the public vehicle, we mm -hmm. still there's a huge gap or a huge uh, question mark about the interior use. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the only comment I have, but I, overall, I think you've nailed it. It looks really nice. Thank you. Yeah, I just tried to make it look like bubble gum. That's uh, my <laughs> yes. imagination was. <laughs> Yeah, your vehicles looks yummy. Oh, like I the one those like fake real cakes or those cakes they make that look like <laughs> Dorito actually, bags. I actually Sorry. really like that detail where you kind of like stick the engine, not just, you know, make it, a, not just, you know, like you didn't create a frame around it, but you actually like stick it. So it was really funky for me. Uh, yeah, makes everything really edible. <laughs> so. I am a Thank foodie, you. so yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. Thank, thank you for your work, Clark. I, I I see that you did a really good, good, really good work. Thank you for the materials. I, I think the materials is a good choice for you. Um, but I, I'm quite I'm quite curious about the scale of the public vehicle because you have one render in where you have your public vehicle next to the passenger, and maybe it's my perception, but it seems to be quite a bit small the vehicle. Let's so, go um, back to it. Yep, this one. The, these two. The one at the right. Yes, exactly that one. <laughs> Mm. So from my perspective, I think the public vehicle should be quite a bit bigger. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe it's because we don't have a same upset. Maybe because we don't have the diagram yet. Yeah. But for me, it's quite hard to, to, to read it. But that's the only comment that I have. And I know that your network suffered a lot of changes. And I think the <laughs> one the one that you have right now is the best one. I totally agree with I that. I hope. OK, well, I hope so, yeah. <laughs> well, if you can do it better, please do it. I think I can do it better, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but for now, it's a good job. I, I, con congratulations. It's a good job. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. It's fine. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a ton to add. I like the style a lot. Uh, I think it's really fun and compelling. Um, there's some areas where maybe uh, there were some very early images that had some really, really uh, well executed light effects. Um, uh, I think it's up. Um, anyhow, um, layering some of these into some of the bottom images, I think, could really help. Um, mm -hmm. There's like you don't want to lose the character that you're going after, but there mm -hmm. are some some aspects of it. You know, whether it be the horizon line or especially like the rendering of those um, translucent hexagonal extrusions, mm -hmm. they're devil to render really well. Um, and maybe there's some tricks that you might, uh, or aspects of it, uh, that you might play around with, uh, in I think, ray tracers. Yeah. Struggle I think with the, something like this, but, uh, I think mainly it was like the, the like, I think about it's like more of a modeling error, like, um, how I extruded it. So I had, I used grasshopper to like generate the, the kind of hexagonal formations and where I'd want them to kind of dive into the ground, but they were, I treat it separately, like the top portion and the bottom portion. So there may be, that's why it has like a. A seam line to it 
if that makes sense. So it could be that's why. Um, because the texture overall is fine, but when it seems from the like the the floor to like the bottom of the the site is where it has that transition that looks a little funky. I could have yeah. used content. I was trying to use like content aware fill in Photoshop, but that clearly was not working very well. Yeah, I, uh, I can't say. I mean, go for it. I I I think that everything is uh, everything's going in a really cool direction, so I'm not worried about it at all. But um, just some of those. I think those small details as the project evolves will really help it um, become just something that you can't look away from and be very, very compelling. So. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Clark. You are a powerhouse one person team there. And I really love how you presented everything. It looks like a cute gummy land there with uh, all sorts of candies and cute props there. And uh, I just love your overall renders where you show everything from dogs to networks. The style of presentation is really, really nice there and very interesting. It's, it looks super cute to me. The project overall is super nice and cute. I'll just start adding like little lollipops, you know, growing through the trees. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> like Willy Wonka's little ch chocolate factory. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you all for the comments. Thank you, Clark. Also, I want to mention that Clark offered his station to help some of the teams, uh, yeah. which is super cool. So thank you for that. So uh, I mean, it kept job. me. It did keep me warm at night, so that's why. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> that's fine, yeah. So yeah, uh, very, very good progress in the last few weeks. And that, that's for like most of the teams in actually would be. And uh, thank you. And now we move on to the last group of this uh, last team of this group, which is B2, uh, Yusra and Bao. Hello. Hello. Hi, we are Hello. the cabin. With the destruction of Earth, a few humans traveled through the dimensional portals in search of safe haven. I and my brother followed them into the Ark X, which is supposed to be the safe haven for humans. This vessel started moving through space and all of a sudden a crash happened. The humans ended up in this extremely hot and arid environment. Our skin felt like it was on fire. Our flesh was burning. Muscles were drying out. Moisture on our body was evaporating. Everyone looked like skeletal callous alien, we began to mutate into this organic cellular creatures. Our posture began to evolve. We became super compact and stunned. We were mutants. In this unbearable heat, our body became this fractal head structure. It became an alternate reality for us. We transformed into the retardant. As time went on, we began to create our new home, a new borrow, which was made up of fragmented rock pieces pebbles and mineral ground. The retardant dwelling, a monolithic haven, consisted of layered rock panels, translucent dust filters, thermal pebbles, and bioluminous energy crystals. This was to shelter us from the extreme heat and to adapt to the new climate. Our colonies usually are nestled within narrow spaces in the canyons of mountains. This is our new home, growing from lava in mountains made up of minerals and rock. Although we're rooted in the mountain, the colony branches out over time into the stem-like tree with dwelling clusters forming along in the mountain. Over time, we start developing means of moving around the colony. We developed two systems, a private and public vehicle. The private vehicle was assembled by younger retardants we quickly put in together small elements they found in the environment and having this more monolithic element while the more mature retardants were worked on more refined mechanical vehicles for the private transportation the private vehicle is a monolithic vehicle made up of two segments a passenger capsule which is where the creatures stay and the hull which is the vessel for minerals and rocks the passenger pod is, a, is the primary chamber where the creature stays, made up of thin rock panels, mineral tissues, and a central globe, and various forms of crystals. All parts of the main chamber are welded together by this dark mineral frame. 
which is like an exoskeleton, tying the different fragments together. The crystal globe in the front is the main energy core of the port, and it serves as the control center for the entire system. The disintegrating rock shells on the body are coated with liquid shame to increase their durability, and they have tiny energy crystals that help prevent the shame from melting and maintain and glue these fragments together. The hood of the vehicle has these horns, horn-like antennas, which are adorned with small sensor crystals which help geolocate the system and serve as trail detectors for the vehicle. It also serves as danger sensors for the capsule. On the side of the vehicle is the mineral filtration membrane, which extracts and condenses moisture from the air and dehumidifies the interior. It also serves as insulation, storing heat and recalibrating the temperature in the chamber. The grill on the side and the back of the capsule helps ventilate the vehicle and serves as exhaust for combust energy. The pod, the, the pod is usually accessed by two panel doors on the back which also connect the hall through a springy magnetic rock membrane to the back. The hull, on the other hand, is shaped like a cone, creating resistance to turbulence and wind. It's made up of large hollow interlocked sand rock pebbles compacted together. This part of the vehicle is fully magnetic and collects stones and minerals from the surrounding as the vehicle moves through the colony. The small energy crystals on the side are known as lifters because they have divine forces which make the rock pebbles seem extremely light. The larger crystals in the center of the hull help give energy to the hull and power it. This crawler has three limbs designed as hard talus rocks with stones to enhance movement through the rough and rugged ground field and with crushed rocks and thorns in this new environment. It also gives them a better grip when crawling. The front loops control direction and speed for the vehicle and the back limbs serve as support primarily for the hull. The private vehicles I kept along the here you can see the layers of the private of the crawler vehicle with the skin and the membrane and the retardant uh, back frame of the vehicle. Now, here you can see the two different parts and how they're connected together, the front capsule and the hall in the back. So here's a little preview of the crawlers in all their glory. These bike, these private vehicles are kept along mineral depots where they and small and store the smaller crystals that they carry in the hall. This depot serves as a transit hub for the crawlers coming from outside the colony, connecting them to the private network within the colony. The docks are made up of also fragmented rock, but also have these translucent sheets on the front for visibility and hard rock panels, which are magnetic boards. The thin shell monopod, they, they are attached to the thin shell monopod which is where the vehicles are usually docked. The vehicles are attached to these depots through these panels. The docks are made up of fragmented. The monopods, which are equipped with sensors, open up laterally when the crawlers are floored. And apart from being storage chambers for the crawlers, they also serve as visibilization and cleaning chambers for the crawlers. They also attach to the hollow core of the depot, which serves as the entrance to the core. This core serves as a security point for the colony. The retardant made vehicles that was run by energy crystals that track the energy trails. The public vehicle were used by the retardants to mine and excavate the crystals and minerals from the mineral quarries. These crystals form the lifeline of the retardants and the colony. The retardants travel to mining sites as a crowd and they find these crystals depending on their needs. Structurally, the vehicle has a stay area and a mechanical area. 
well the mechanical areas are both a stay the area and the return stay and travel in the stay area these are the stay pods for the returns these are occupied by the returns and they store their collected crystals and minerals from the mining sites this changes according to each returns these are the energy trail detectors the energy trail detector sends the energy trail and guides the public vehicle along the path this portion helps in the navigation of the public vehicle and make sure there is no collision between the vehicles by creating a rippling force between these detectors but this crystal core forms the life of the public vehicle as it traps the energy from the environment and transfers to the vehicle that makes it more functional you could see that the public vehicle is made up of rock panels energy stones unique minerals and other filters that makes them all together this is more into the stay area the, the stay area we could see the stay pots more clearly with a few returns and with the uh, minerals they have collected from the mining quarries the stay areas are anchored by an internal lobby where the returns gather before their journey begins this is the mechanical area the mechanical floor consists of crystal refineries and energy banks that runs the public vehicle the mechanical floor is supported by bigger energy crystals from which the energy is supplied throughout the vehicle the pods here is a reservoir of crystals that gets refined and converted to usable energy source for the amalgamation and corpuscles and we say hi to our returnants as they are ready to take off the journey the lobby has unique lava stones that anchor the whole vehicle and enables them to flow through the levitation the lobby has a central spiral spiral stone case that takes onto the mechanical floor this is the interior of the stay pods and here one of the returnants is happy that he has collected a large number of crystals from the quarry the public public vehicles dock along the energy rocks that derives its energy from the floating lava mountain these lava mountains flow due to the electromagnetic field from the mountain minerals that has been in lava state for a long period of time the crystals inside these energy rocks are the root of the trails as they are calibrated to create trails that lead to the great mining quarry the trails are the energy field that is created by the insane amount of the heat field in the mining quarry the docking station hosts the public vehicles that are boarded through an entrance where the returns enter into the lower stay area and find their stay pods now let's move look more into yeah, the network. guys uh we over time like try to be a little bit yeah. faster let's move look more into these into more how these vehicles are con connected and navigated these are the crawl networks the returns use the private vehicle to find rocks and minerals in and around the amalgamation they crawl along these rock surfaces that has minute small crystals and minerals sprouting from the rock surfaces the private vehicle move along the energy path of these lava rocks the energy trail serves as the path for the public vehicle to guide them to the mining quarries these are the energy trails and these uh, they are actually heat shocks that are created through the attractive forces from mining quarries the returnants uses the private vehicle to move uh, from one cluster to another cluster and from there corpuscle to their neighboring the crystals and energy minerals in these private docking stations create an energy field that are minute and levitate the private vehicle as the crystals in the private vehicle gets attracted to it here you could see a fully functioning returnant colony oh we can see some vehicles leaving the amalgamation to the mining quarries and there are energy trails around the amalgamation come let's just 
look into ingredients of the colony more closely. So here are some moments within this system. I've mentioned earlier, you can see how the trails, the trails go into the docking station, and you can see some retardants and some barriers moving along them. To go a little closer, you can see how the we can see how the public network connects to the colony, how the private network intertwines with the corpuscles and the organization. We can also see here how when we, we can also see here how the retardant interact with the farms that are on the exterior of the corpuscles and how the network works with them. Looking even closer, you can see how all of these uh, docking stations happen along the main public depot and these are the main transit hubs for the development. You can also see a bunch of crawlers moving around the system. Although we retired them as good figuring out how our system works, we hope one day you can come explore today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Beautiful storytelling, beautiful project. Uh, there are so many <laughs> details that like you've thought about and you wanted to show us. And um, so that was super, super uh, cool. It was really powerful, like, uh, you know, like all these like uh, ideas about like how they're coming together. I loved uh, especially uh, some of the sections and exploded yeah, diagrams of really like showing how things are you know really like fit together how they come together how they work and i really appreciate all the effort and all these like views and uh, you know like uh, diagrams like to explain like really every aspect of um, the work and you like it's evident that like you put so much effort also like into the interiors and really like um, being very thorough throughout like the whole process the visuals are elevated from like what we've seen last so thank you really for making this like extra effort and to keeping in touch with mike uh, with a lot of like in the background like to really like elevate those because really like i feel that you're really like for you this chapter was also one of the really important ones where every aspect is coming together and we can see the project in its full glory um, so, um, really, congratulations from my side. Uh, can you please just stay on one image and yeah, stop moving? Yeah. Uh, hi, Yusra yeah. and Bala Kumara. Ah, sorry. No, Pedro, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Um, no, no, go I, ahead, I just was about to say that this particular image looks more like a map from a video game. So I insist in the video game. I, I'm really happy with your particular project, and I was I was not expecting your public vehicle to be that complex, but it's fine. It's fine. W while you were explaining your public vehicle, I was thinking that that you will need a network to explain your your public vehicle because it's really complex. But but I like it honestly. I like it. Um, but overall, I think you made a really good work here. I really like even your language, even even your the way you design your pieces. It's it's really simple in a way. The way how you combine your elements create this kind of complex looking objects that you have right now. I think this is a good, really good work, guys. Congratulations from my side. Nothing else to add. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Balak Maran and Yusra. Uh, uh, it was it was really nice to see uh, all this development. Uh, I'm just gonna go like you know, certain items like, uh, for example, like the private vehicle. I really appreciate you, Sra, that you stick on Houdini, you didn't give up. So it was, it's really valuable for me. And I love that those details are, didn't really ruin the design. I think they're like really well, um, like they, 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 they like complement everything each other and, and just did, they don't just, you know, look really bizarre. I think everything looks really cool. Um, regarding to the public vehicle, uh, this was a success even from the beginning. And those details that you've added, um, I think they're like really on point. Everything actually in this project looks very cohesive. So really successful. And uh, I still insist you to publish this as a game <laughs> because everything seems so, you know, like uh, it's it feels so lot, so much like everything can be worked in a gaming environment. I don't know, just because how low poly and those details, 
I can see it happening actually. So uh, I really, I'm still waiting <laughs> to be honest, but overall, really nice project. Uh, thank you so much for the efforts. You were always uh, eager to learn new things in Houdini. So uh, I think you've na you both nailed it. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't have much to add. It's super fun and really cool. Um, the only two things I could see maybe uh, adding even more value to what is already a really cool project would be uh, making sure you focus on uh, depth of field and really getting these images to have uh, all the depth that they deserve. You know, um, there's some aspects that I think just by pushing some of the background back a little bit more, pulling some things forward, it would really make it leap. Uh, and then. The only other um, nature I have to do with maybe some of some of the materiality could be maybe just slightly revisited. Um, the textures and patterning is really, really there, but, but there's, there's just some some maybe small amount of, of, of something that could really um, provide uh, another level of depth, especially when, uh, in, in some of the close up um, visuals. Yeah. Thank you guys. Uh, you did a very good job this chapter. A uh, lot of details, the amount of details, the amount of work that you put in. Uh, super cool. And just one thing that you should be working more on the presentation, like at the actual presentation, because a lot of things were like you have a lot of information that weren't you weren't able to I think. Uh, present in the best possible way, but this is if this is the work for the next uh, the next chapter and the in the presentation in the end. But that would be my one critique. But for the work, it's it's super good. So congratulations, you are so consistent this chapter, and it shows the the work. From what we we started. Thank you, thank you, Sina. thank you, Bao, thank you. Uh, and now I think we're going to A one. Sat. And she will be the last team. Hello, everyone. Once again, let me just share my screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm Prasad, and I welcome you all to Nido's The Nidroid Haven. It all started in the year 2222. Vast amounts of land had been reclaimed by the oceans, people left their cities in search of refuge. Political tensions were at an all-time high, with wars resulting in a permanent nuclear winter. Radiation levels peaked. The only survivors of this catastrophe were the Aquinox, Captain Spectre, and his diver's crew of 300. They lived in a habitat underwater with the help of artificial gills made from didarian or jellyfish DNA. Increasing radiation levels meant that they had to find a way to quickly extend their lifespan of their suits to survive. They descended into deep waters. Eventually, the radiation exposure caused the Nidarian cells to mutate. This happened in stages. The captain, with the Aurelian gene, had to rely on mechanical interventions to survive. He became the first Nidoroid, a jellyfish cyborg hybrid. Being a resourceful lot, they realized the potential of using a polyp as a habitat. They started designing a structure that utilized four matured polyps from each of the species, along with mechanical intervention to form pods. Multiple pods occupied by one species formed a unit. These units together formed a corpuscle, and these nidroids lived, in, lived their life initially in the corpuscle. As time went by, the need for a city arose. Initial design interventions were based on coral polyps. Each city consists of towers that grow and is also constructed over time. Similar to the corpuscle, the gelatinous membrane here has an underlying structure that serves as protection from elements. The towers are made up of several modules that are connected to each other based on their functions. With the expansion came the need for an organized mode of transport, something that could be mechanically efficient and something that could also connect organically to the nidroid themselves. The design process required a procedural approach, one where multiple options could be explored to satisfy the unique situation of the nidroids. The private vehicle, the NIDO 042, is the jetpack that came about when the wonders of the biophysics and kinetics met. With its biomimetic propulsion system and state-of-the-art technology, this vehicle is designed to take the Aurelian on an efficient journey throughout the 
ocean depths. The first mode is the swimmer mode with a propulsion system inspired by the efficient motion of the jellyfish with its tentacles that powers the jetpack. Here, it functions by creating a vortex that propels the vehicle forward with remarkable speed, precision, and allows it to move through the water quickly and quietly. The second mode is the crawler mode that uses the tentacles to walk the floors of the ocean. The aerodynamic design is inspired by the jellyfish anatomy, giving it sleek and a streamlined profile that cuts through the water like knife. And with its advanced sensors and navigation systems, the vehicle can navigate even the most challenging underwater environments like the deep sea trenches. The advanced mechanical wires that connects the jellyfish DNA to the vehicle itself gives it an immense speed and the headpiece is for the protection of the Nidoroid himself. Here, now you can see that there's a small controller, which is basically what they use to control the jetpack itself. Here, the controllers do not control the jetpack, but at this particular instance, they control the tentacles of the new, uh, of the whole jetpack itself. Here, the, the Nidarian basically has these polyps, which are uh, connected to act, act like a brain system that connect the uh, uh, the polyps, the organic nature to the vehicle itself. And here you have these uh, tantalum shells that provide necessary stability and protection that is needed. The sensors utilize sonar and other advanced technologies that allow vehicles to detect the and avoid obstacles, map the seafloor, and communicate with other underwater vehicles or surface vehicles. Here, you can see the mechanism that the Nidoroid uses to go inside of the jetpack which probably get back to. And again, here you have the Nidarian collecting polyps from the ocean floor to cultivate and build more aggregations, which we'll probably revisit again. Oh, it's over here. OK. So now moving on to the public vehicle or the Sinea 021. That is the jet that helps the Nidarian carry cargo and transport themselves through the city. Like the private vehicle, it also has tentacles that helps with the propulsion of the vehicle. Here you can see that there are claws designed, which probably help, the, which help, which basically retract and extend rapidly and allow the vehicle to quickly respond to the changing situations. The vehicle consists of two wagons where the Nidarian passengers are seated. The driver module is the organic powered module, very much like the Corpuscle here. With its sophisticated safety features, including autopilot and collision avoidance, the Aurelian can explore the ocean depths with ease. The tantalum shells here are reinforced with intricate shield systems that create a force field around the vehicle. Now, moving on to the passenger module. So, the state-of-the-art propellers in the in the process in in the passenger module help help it move across with with ease. The modules are basically have uh, modules basically have a defense system that also incorporates a small electrically charged chamber that contains venomous fluid. When the vehicle detects a potential threat, the chamber could be activated, releasing the venom and deterring the threat. Here you can see the entry points to the vehicle. Now this is where the Nidroids enter through enter into the uh, public vehicle. Mo moving on to the private network. Here you can see that the private network basically starts uh, from the top and then reaches down to the base of the tower. And from where you have a bridge like network, which eventually reaches out to the public network itself. Now, here you can see that there are pass passages provided in the public dock, which the Nidarian uses to move around. And you can also see that the Sinai are stationed. The, so Nidarians follow a sharp clock and these public vehicles move about in a timely manner, something that's reflected in the day out of the dock. They use the jetpacks and dock to connect to the charging ports. Thus, the trip also helps them recharge. The modules can also take in power from the Nidarians if necessary. 
The Cinea follow a route close to the contours of the aggregation below. Several modified Genesis towers also act as stops. An efficient network system is created that follows the tower from the top and then flows across the ocean floor, which is eventually formed, which eventually forms the entire Nidiotopia, a truly well-connected Nidroid haven. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I love the presentation and every uh, detail of it. I love like how much like uh, how well you're incorporating really your prosthesis with uh, the the vehicle, like how it actually like hugs hugs the prosthesis, and then like how much it actually like makes sense like towards like the the movements like of the um of the water and like everything that like you're actually like thinking about like all these like different aspects um i love also that the materiality like has a lot of uh, you know like it feels that like it's been used right like the metals are not perfect like you're really like working with those materials so a lot of this work, like it's definitely like commendable, like it's beautiful that like you're you're thinking about all these like different levels. Um, do we have any section also of the public vehicle that like you could uh, zoom in? Uh, I was basically like working the day on rendering that one, but then it just kept crashing, so I couldn't like make it complete. But this is this was like the basic idea of how the module would work where you have these uh, charging clocks, which are basically, uh, you know, attached to the module itself, and they can probably fly in with their jet, like swim in with their jetpacks and connect to it. Okay, so they're so like, yeah, you're incorporating both the the the, the public and the, the um uh, the the public vehicle. The private. And then you have like yeah, the private also like inside. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, thank you for sharing this. Thank you. Hello, Prasant. Hey, um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, and I really like, I really enjoyed this project, to be honest, from the beginning. Uh, I remember you had some, you know, you were having a hard time landing on a concept, but I feel like this is the best one that we could get, this jetpack idea. Um, I yeah. actually, uh, everything looks, the quality of the renders are really nice. One thing that I wanted to add is just, the I remember, especially like if you were to look at um, the jetpack from the side, you have these, you know, like flow of yeah. these panels. I wish to see another material that is different than because everything from from a far away perspective looks singular. I wish to okay. see that you would expose some of those panels, but in a very, very optimum way. Uh, okay. That's like my only comment about that. Yeah, because yeah. I remember okay. also yeah, I like. Um, these plug ideas, like you, you only see them when you, when you have like a really zoomed in image, but from okay. a far away, you don't really, you don't really see that. So I think, you know, those type of details, exposing those details, you know, that's what I'm trying to say. But overall, okay. uh, I, I really like, like I, uh, like how organic and mechanic this uh, whole ideation is. So in terms of that, I think everything seems to be worked. Uh, so thank you so much. That's my only Thank comment. You. Thank you. Yeah, great uh, comments. Uh, and then I also like, I just want to add that uh, also like the choice of colors, right? Because your background is blue, like, but uh, here it's like darker blue. So it really accentuates like the design and we can really like start to see like the different elements and different panels. But when you're like on uh, lighter blue, because like again, all the choice of colors that you're having is just like more difficult really to comprehend and really the, like it feels like a little bit flat. OK, so even, you know, thinking through like some of those uh, really like differences and like what you already have on the background and if it's actually like uh, helping your storytelling or not, it's another aspect to think about. Um, yeah, yeah, I will look on that for sure. Thank you. Hi, Prasad. Hey Pedro. Congratulations for your work. I really like your your work. I like how you combine this kind of mechanical parts with organic ones. I think you did it pretty well. The only comment that I may <laughs> maybe I would have is um, texture wise. In 
in in the in the private vehicle you have this beautiful combination between like anodized metals with um with other type of metals with this kind of roughness maps on, on on it which i think is fine but in the other hand in the public vehicle you have like too much of this kind of um roughness texture along the whole okay. the whole vehicle in the pub in the public vehicle so i think i think it maybe it's too much yeah okay. you maybe you could do a zoom in 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 the top view of your vehicle maybe yeah the, yeah, maybe that one at the, at the bottom. Yeah, if you do a zoom, in, you you will see that this kind of texture uh, looks weird because I think okay. maybe it's too much. But apart okay, yeah, apart yeah. from that small detail, I think your project is, is a really good one. Thank you. Yeah, I, I I'll see. I will work on that. Like I'll probably like reach out to you again. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, really cool project. I love the formwork. Um, it it helps self contextualize the elements as though they're in the as though they're in the ocean just by how they work or just by how they look, which is really really cool. Um, and, nice. and 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 really well done. Um, I will say, as with uh, the other water project and 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 some of the other projects, especially in terms of the 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 overall shots of the structure. Um, they're really hard to contextualize, especially if they're in these unique environments like under the ocean. Yeah. Um, so just everything you, you can do to help uh, put them in that context as, as much as you can will be really, really valuable. So whether that be, you know, I, I think especially like the use of um, atmospherics, but as well as, you know, uh, just elements like fish, things like this that will help yeah, uh, yeah. ground this ground this structure and make it really feel like, oh yeah, we're 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 really under the ocean. So um, yeah. I think just those small details, once they're layered on top yeah, of yeah, what sure, is already yeah. really meaningful base, yeah, agree, will uh, yeah. will will really be excellent. So um, yeah, really well done. Thank thank you. Yeah, sure. I I work on it later. I agree. Congratulations, Prasad. Nice works on the Thanks, details. Like, like uh, we always say that you have an eye of detail. That uh, every every vehicle that you did had a very close up details on the jets, on the wires, and stuff like that. But uh, as said, we know the render did not happen yeah. like the ones that we were looking for. So yeah. maybe we can work on that. But I also agree with Pedro's comment on the public vehicle. Those textures were overwhelming at a point. So maybe we could like control those roughness and the reflectivity as we go with those renders on the public vehicle. While on the side of the yeah. private jet, it's like a super nice uh, combination of uh, both reflectivity and the roughness there. OK, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Final comments. Okay, so thank you very much everyone for joining us today for offering your comments and reviews like uh, to the students. Uh, it's been really like a great uh, progress in like where, you know, chapter four led us. Like I feel that like a lot of the um, knowledge, like from the beginning of the program, it's really like coming together and we can see like a lot of, uh, you know, like the um, contextual work, but also the detailing and, uh, you know, like just the, the thought behind like the process is really coming together. And I love how much like again, like effort and passion all the teams have put uh, like uh, behind like the really like thoughtful pro projects. Uh, I want to again like thank uh, definitely like uh, the whole team and uh, Zeynep and Pedro especially like for uh, leading this chapter and really killing it. So thank you guys. And also Dean, it's uh, it's not an easy like uh, software, especially like to to teach. So thank you for being present uh, and really like helping the students like learn and of course like the whole team like behind everything and the guests. So I hope you enjoyed today and we'll see you guys actually after a couple of weeks because like we have uh, uh, like uh, some time off uh, for, you know, like Easter. So I just want to, you know, like wish uh, happy holidays to everyone who is, um, you know, like um, celebrating uh, these days and, uh, you know, grab some, uh, you know, like have some uh, good times and uh, relax and we'll see you back like in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much. Also like, um, 
um, basically to all our guests today uh, for their time. All the best. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Happy holidays. Thank you, Thank everyone. you so much, guys. See you, everyone. Take care. Happy holidays, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys.